The reason why the logic is starting to break down now has nothing to do with the actual logical statement. It has to do with like our kind of the external baggage that we're bringing in. Like somebody might say like um, one plus one equals three. And you're like, well, what do you mean by one plus one equals three? That doesn't make any sense. Like, oh, well, because when two sheep come together, three can leave because they had a child. It's like, okay, oh, well, I guess, but that doesn't really have anything to do with one plus one equals three. Uh, I'm, I, don't know, I feel like I'm getting kind of lost now too, but. Um, <laughs> That's all good. Hope... Oh, hold on, wait, I'm I just had assume... a Jimmy Neutron, okay. Okay, okay. I, maybe maybe I'm coming along a little bit more. I kind of understand what you're saying. So if I say that in order to be a thing, oh, oh my God, my brain just expanded three sizes. This is like a classic happen. kind of turf argument. It sounds like you're saying there's um, <clears throat> there's been a kind of chilling effect in the yeah. universities. Or it feels that people way, are, yeah. People are self-censoring and self-silencing. Oh yeah, I can, can confirm 100%. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> Water was just an element. Nevertheless, this it was H2O. True. I'm sorry? This isn't true. true. That water has not always been H2O? Yeah. All you have to do is cross the Mexican border. And over there, it's aqua that's H2O, not water. Aqua means water. Aqua is water. It's a different they, term. Uh, actually, it's <laughs> Oh, no. Right? I, this guy has to be like, what the fuck did I agree to? Oh, shit, dude. It's too much. <laughs> I listened to uh, I listened to a conversation that you had with one of my esteemed colleagues about gender and sex. And I um, talking about Bosch. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know. I, I've gathered you guys have a kind of history. Um, I don't. I don't totally understand all of it, but um, I yeah. guess there's been a falling out or something. Is that right? Um, yeah, you could say that. Um, yeah, that, um, I'm not here to like uh, get get all into that. Um, there's a lot I could say about that, especially in regards to this conversation. But um, yeah, I think that's better. Yeah, I, yeah, no, yeah, it's good. Um, I was gonna say, I mean, I'm I'm happy that he agreed to do the debate, and uh -huh. I felt like he was very civil and professional. I mean, when I first got the invitation, I watched some of his videos, and I was like, oh, I don't, <laughs> I don't think I want to talk to this guy because um, he can be like pretty aggressive and abrasive, uh -huh. um, and so. In reply to the invitation, I was just like, if we could agree that it's going to be civil and professional, then actually it was this conversation with Deborah So that like made me think, oh, okay, maybe maybe we can do this because I thought he was very polite, mm -hmm. but I mean, still defending his points and advancing his perspective. But I think we're professional. somewhat similar in that we tend to match energy a little bit. So if you come in screaming, I'm going to be screaming, and I think he's kind of similar on that. Um, in that as long as you're willing to have like an okay conversation, I think you'll generally be on board with that. He's not gonna like go crazy out of nowhere usually, unless he's talking to me, yeah. but yeah. Um, I didn't wanna, I, I, I didn't wanna retread too much. I read, um, you- Can I just ask you really quick? Are oh, yeah. we streaming right now? Is that- Oh yeah, we... shit, I'm sorry. I you shouldn't need to say this. <laughs> okay. We are streaming, yeah. Oh. I always okay. assume that when I, I call somebody, that. I need to, oh yeah. I so kind of all thought of your we were secrets. Like backstage or something. No, my bad. Um, you haven't said anything too disruptive, don't worry. Uh, but sorry, yeah. yes, I am streaming. Don't, no personal information or anything crazy like that. Okay. Um, what was I gonna say? Um, I read you had one paper where, I think you go through six different arguments um, about separating sex and gender. Are you familiar with the one? Um, the evaluating arguments for the sex gender decision. Yeah, yes. you go through, but I think five of them I thought were pretty convincing. There was one that I didn't like too much, but um, I agree that a lot of the a lot of the um, coming together on figuring out this on, on a lot of these things um, seems to be more rooted in like some kind of social good rather than actually getting to the truth of the matter on anything. Which is kind of a weird way to investigate these issues. Um, I think that's something you point out in that paper a few times. It's something that I notice as well, where if you ask somebody, you know, why why should we draw a distinction between these two things? The answer will usually sometimes lie in some like moral claim that, well, it'd be better to do it because it makes people happy or something, right? Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I was just a little distracted because I was thinking back to what I had said while I thought we weren't streaming. <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> um, I, um, yeah. You're good. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, I was just I was a little distracted. Um, can you say it again? Yeah, you're totally fine. Do you need a minute to collect yourself? <laughs> um, 
I think it was okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I, th I think I think I said to you what I wanted to say if you had brought up that debate, namely, uh -huh. I'm, I'm happy that um, Bosch had agreed to do it, and I think it went well, and I think he was, you know, professional and civil, and yeah. so I don't, I don't really have anything bad to say about the guy. No, nope, I don't think you said anything um, bad, so you're good, yeah. I mean, I did notice that, I, given what I've watched of his videos and um, what I learned in our conversation, I think we disagree about virtually everything. <laughs> but, I mean, I think it's nice that there are these forums online where people are still willing to have conversations even with people who they disagree very, very deeply with. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so yeah, I guess that's all I wanted to say about that. But now you wanted to ask about this paper that I wrote. Um, yeah, or I guess actually before we, um, actually before we dive into that, well actually let's, well, let's formally start. I'm curious. I just woke up like 20 minutes ago too, so sorry. <laughs> um, what, um, how did you even find out about like the online debate sphere? Where, where did this come from? What was your like first introduction to it? Um, well, I've done some like podcasts with on some YouTube channels um, to talk about philosophy and usually Christian philosophy in particular. Um, and then I think somebody had watched one of these things I did about gender stuff and um, recommended to the modern day debate team that I do a debate and I shout out to this this person wish I could shout this person out by name but I don't I don't know the person's name um, but yeah somebody like made the connection and then I got an invitation from James um, yeah and then I wasn't exactly sure what it was <laughs> and whether I wanted to um, do that sort of thing um, and so yeah like I said I watched some videos of Vosh and and I watched that Deborah So video and that convinced me okay I think we could probably have a civil conversation and I noticed that um, some philosophers had been on this modern day debate channel and that made me feel a little bit better about it um, you know Michael Humer has done it mm -hmm. um, so yeah then I decided to just uh, give it a go and see how it went and I think it went pretty well is that something you think you want to well, actually, I was going to say, do you want to do more of that in the future? But I guess you're kind of here oh. now, so. <laughs> well, I think uh, my understanding is this is this is kind of a different setting, and this isn't a debate so much as a no. That's just what I say to that's what I say to pull them in. Okay, I got all my <laughs> my Thunderlord debate Lord notes here, right here. Come here. The pyrotechnics, yeah. Yeah, actually, I actually have some old Facebook pictures that you posted um, 12 years ago. I wanted to ask you about. I'm just getting messed up. Oh wow. Um, but okay, no, gotcha. I, I, I got the impression, I don't know if this is right, but it sounded to me like you were a kind of pioneer in this space of online debating, especially in the Twitch sphere. Yeah, I wouldn't say kind um, of, I would say absolutely. But um, yeah, I, I acknowledge okay. and accept, yeah. And um, I think you have referred to yourself as a debate bro or part of this debate bro community, or maybe the debate bro. Um, the... Uh, prototypical I think um, I used to be more so but I'm trying I have like different uh, approaches now <laughs> to where yeah. I'm not trying to um, yeah I'm not trying to do the ultimate I'm trying to be more empathetic than I'm here to shit in your throat and destroy you or whatever kind of thing because I find that the yeah. empathetic thing tends to work better yeah um, that is the impression I had gotten um, and so yeah that's why I was looking forward to talking with you about this gotcha um, I don't have super strong feelings about um, philosophically about a lot of the trans stuff um, in terms of, especially when you start talking about anything related to metaphysics, especially because I don't even know what metaphysics is. And every time I try to read about it, um, it seems like nobody knows what metaphysics is or if it's even possible to do. So, <laughs> so I'm going to be totally honest with you. My philosophy is very rusty. I'm not the best yeah. at this. And um, yeah, just as uh, just because I know you have a formal background. So if I misuse any terms or if I say anything that doesn't make sense, um, it's probably not you being confused about something that I know that you don't. It's probably me just using a word completely incorrectly. So feel free to um, provide clarification or something uh, for yeah, sure. some thought that I have. Yeah, no problem. Um, just before we before we dive into the conversation too much, um, I'm curious on what what it what do you what do you think about this? Isn't I'm not attacking anything else. But what, what is your perspective on the conversation you had about agua? Yeah, so um, I've thought about that a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think what was going on there, um, I think a lot of people, when they watched that exchange about water, a lot of people were frustrated because they thought this wasn't really to the point and this is taking too long. And um, I mean, when I read the perspective of 
Vosh fans, I know that they were frustrated with me and they feel like I'm just not understanding. Uh, when, I, when I read mm -hmm. perspectives on the other side, they feel the same way about Vosh. But I think what was happening, if you sort of have eyes to see what was happening in that bit of the debate, was it was, it was a clash or a conflict between two very old um, views of the world, two very old views of the relationship between our minds and the world. And um, I think there are, I mean, something I tell my students, this is, this is kind of a crude lens you can use, but I think it's pretty useful to understand the history of philosophy. There's, it's really just a conflict between like three views of the world, three ways of thinking about the relationship between our minds and the world. Um, one of them, the one that I hold is, I would call supernaturalism. And on that view, ultimately, everything is explained in terms of um, a divine mind, the mind of God. So ultimately, all explanations bottom out with uh, explanations in terms of the mind of God. Um, that's supernaturalism, and it has a very old pedigree. I would put Plato and Aristotle in that category. Um, it was dominant. It probably reached its zenith in like the Middle Ages, and it's been in decline since then. The stock has been in decline since then. Another view of the world is um, naturalism, according to which um, ultimately everything is explained in terms of fundamental physical particles and the laws that govern them. Mm -hmm. So at rock bottom, like everything that's true is made true by that physical stuff um, and the laws that govern it. So that's naturalism. And then just the last one, and this is the one that I think um, Vosh would be placed in is um, what you might call postmodernism, but I know that word is used in many different ways by many different people and sometimes used as like a pejorative. But, um, and I don't think that's the best word for it because it makes it sound very new. Like, not only is it modern, it's postmodern. But this is actually a very old view, and it goes at least back to Protagoras, who said, um, man is the measure of all things, of what is that it is, and of what is not that it is not. Like, humans are somehow... We, we are responsible for making what's true, true. And we make what's false, false. And so on this view, everything ultimately is explained in terms of us, our creative activities, our thought and our language. Um, and so I think you could, we could call this postmodernism or creative anti-realism. It's anti-realism because these people, when you ask them like, well, what is the world like independent of our minds? They say things that sometimes sound like they think there is no such thing. <laughs> there is no world independent of our minds. There is no world outside language. Mm -hmm. Or if there is a world out there, it's literally indescribable. It is, it's ineffable. As soon as you start describing it, you are imposing concepts on it that the world doesn't really answer to. And so I think that's why folks in this camp use words like arbitrary. They think that the concept, the conceptual scheme that we operate in and that we use was made by us. So mm -hmm. it really was created by our wills. Um, and it doesn't correspond to reality. It, it can't be like true or false. It can't be made true or false by reality. Gotcha. It, yeah, they have a conception of truth and falsity, but it's not correspondence to reality. Um, so anyway, I think what was happening in that portion of the debate was... Um, I, a supernaturalist who believes in mind-independent truth, was saying things like, you know, there are these facts out there in the world, like water is H2O, and it was true before we got here. We didn't make it true. Um, and then Vosh, speaking up for the, the creative anti-realist view, was uh, resisting that idea. Gotcha. Okay, I've never actually heard any of these three terms in my life. I have heard naturalism. Um, well, I think I've heard it in other contexts than this in particular. Um, de based on your description of the three, I guess I sound like I would probably be um, this like creative anti-realist or postmodernist. Although, um, well, yes. Well, I have a very limited um, understanding of your history and your views, but uh -huh. the sense I've gotten maybe is it sounded like at one time in the past you were much more squarely in the creative anti-realist camp. But maybe so, you find yourself migrating towards naturalism. Uh, possibly. So I guess the, the way, ha, have, are you familiar with the term ultimate skeptic? Um, I have heard you say it, but I don't totally know. I, no, I think great. I heard you talking with somebody named Ram about it. <laughs> okay, gotcha. So like 
u- ultimate skepticism is going to be the guy who is like a, a like an epistemic anti-realist and a metaphysical anti-realist and he's going to ask why a million times to every single question that you ever pose to prove that you can't ground anything out in anything and he'll use it to derail every conversation about philosophy to prove that ultimately uh, you can't be the arbiter of any completely true or factual statement um, and it's just kind of like the it's like the ultimate online yeah. debate bro to question everything um and i think i i, I guess i don't know if it's like every uh, beginning philosophy adventure falls down that hole but i'd say like a few years ago um I, I was probably more in that camp and then i've kind of moved from being like i think deep down i'm probably ultimately skeptical so if you tell me for instance that you can convey or have some sort of like actual true knowledge of the, the world independent of your mind and you can know those things i would say i don't know about that but um, I'm willing to like build off of some assumptions and then move from there because to be ultimately skeptical is to ultimately be completely absurd and there's not really any productive conversation you can have originating from that point if you want to like adhere strictly to it, you know? Yeah. No, we definitely have skeptics like this in <clears throat> philosophy and mm-hmm. it's not just in first year philosophy. Like some of them really stick with it. Sure. Um, and I guess that's because uh, something you learn pretty quickly about knowledge, like once you start studying epistemology, is it's pretty hard to come by and it's easy to lose. And all you need to do to like make someone lose knowledge is um, bring up a possibility that they can't rule out. Yeah. So if I asked you, for example, like, do you know where your car is right now? You might say, of course, yeah, I parked it in my garage or on the street or whatever. I know where my car is. All I have to do is point out like, well, you know, it could have been stolen in the last five minutes. Can you rule that out? Oh, no, I guess I can't rule that out. Maybe it got stolen in the five minutes. So do you really know where your car is? Oh, I guess I don't now. You know, um, so knowledge is elusive, as philosophers say, and all you got to do is bring up these, um, all t- these possibilities that can't be ruled out. And I think people discover that pretty quickly mm-hmm. when they start talking with other people, especially when they get into arguments. It's very easy to um, sort of cast doubt on a view, um, to deprive people of knowledge, to raise skeptical concerns. That's pretty easy to do. Sure. Or even more fundamental, I think, um, is it it Descartes' demon, the idea that somebody could be presenting a false... It's like like the historic version of brain in a vat, you know? Um, And I find that that those are, if I'm being truly honest, are pretty inescapable. Um, But then, like I said, it's a little absurd to enter... force those into every conversation and it's like okay well if you know Descartes demon is true have you ever considered throwing yourself out the window it's like well no of course not I don't want to die or it's like okay you don't know where your car is like where do you walk every single day to find it well I guess I assume it's outside you know it's kind of silly to um, for the purpose of a debate play the ultimate skeptic but in every other role in your life you're operating on a ton of assumptions all the time um, so that's why I, I think that's right maybe the best the best example of somebody who I mean Descartes did that little um, evil demon thought experiment, but Mm -hmm. he tried to control the skepticism. (laughs) He tried to put it back in the bottle when he was done. Um, He he wanted to destroy his structure of belief so that he could rebuild it from the ground up, try to do philosophy afresh. And he wanted to end up with absolute certainty, and he thought he did. But um, somebody who never put the genie back in the bottle was David Hume, who was skeptical of virtually everything. He was skeptical that there was such a thing as causation. He was skeptical that we could know anything about the future, that we could know things by induction. He was skeptical that God existed. He was skeptical that he himself existed. (laughs) He was like the ultimate skeptic. But then what people pointed out is, can't live this way, right? Mm -hmm. And he he acknowledged that. He said, yeah, you know, in the study, when I'm doing philosophy, I can't help but be overcome by these doubts. But then when I leave my study and I go play, I think he said, I think he said billiards. He's, he wouldn't play. He would go play games with his friends, um, and he acknowledged, like, "Yeah, I don't. I'm not skeptical of things when I'm when I'm out there navigating the real world." Mm-hmm. So um, even an ultimate skeptic like David Hume acknowledged that it is hard to live consistently with these skeptical principles. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I feel pretty similar. Um, I hear Hume referenced a lot. I bought one of his books, but I'm going to be co- totally honest with you. I don't believe that philosophy is hard to read because the concepts are difficult to engage with. I think a lot of writers are just very dog shit in philosophy. And anytime I've got yeah. a sentence with eight commas in it, I'm starting to wonder what in the hell is going on. But um, someday yeah. I will finish that. I think it was a uh, treatise on, it's one of his like really popular. Yeah, uh, I think I made the same mistake when I was an undergraduate. Um, I 
it was brought to my attention that there's this thing called philosophy and that's what I've been talking about. And so mm-hmm. maybe I should go read some philosophy. Sure. Yeah. And I just went to the bookstore and I went to the, the campus bookstore and I went to the philosophy section and I was like, um, oh, Immanuel Kant, I've heard of him. And I pulled out critique of pure reason. And I thought this will help me know whether philosophy is for me. And, and here I you are with honestly, a PhD somehow, huh? Yeah. Well, that <laughs> you was stuck it was with really it. Dis- yeah. That could have ruined things for me because I kept like trying to read it and I would get like 12 pages in and I was like, I have no idea what's happening in here. And I think if you asked a lot of philosophers, what's the worst book you could give to somebody who's brand new to philosophy? It's probably that one. Mm-hmm. And even Kant acknowledged that he was a bad writer and that was, mm-hmm. that was a poor piece of writing. And if you try to read David Hume, you might have a similar experience, if only because the the language is so archaic and hard to understand. But if you want it, I'd be happy to send you some contemporary philosophy where people are actually striving for clarity, um, and it would be much easier to understand. Oh, I've already done that. I've read every book oh, okay. by uh, Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson on philosophy, so okay. I'm very well equipped. With, no, I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, I think you might be joking. Um, yeah. But I, I was actually going to mention this little landscape that I put out there with like supernaturalism, naturalism, postmodernism. It's okay. kind of handy because you can locate people on that map. People like Sam Harris and well, actually Jordan Peterson is not a great example because I don't know where to put him. He's kind of he's kind of all over the place. Mm-hmm. But Sam Harris is like pretty squarely in the naturalist camp. Although, given some of the stuff he says about meditation, that's a little spooky and maybe a, maybe not not so naturalist friendly. <laughs> But he's definitely in the naturalist camp. And I think something interesting that's happening, and then I'll, I'll drop this little landscape stuff if you mm-hmm. want, but um, something that's interesting to watch if you look at the history of ideas and the history of philosophy is the fortunes of these three views have risen and fallen throughout time. And when one of the views is like in ascendancy or enjoying dominance, the other two views kind of ally with each other and form alliances. And so I think right now, the spirit of the age is very much this postmodern view. That, that's sort of the dominant view in the academy and in the popular culture. And what you see is there's a, a surprising alliance between like naturalists and supernaturalists who otherwise wouldn't have very much in common and wouldn't really hang out together. They sort of, yeah, they form these alliances against, um, against postmodernism. So I found that in the gender debates, like I find myself allied with um, like radical feminists and gender critical feminists and just hardcore naturalists. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and on any other topic, we wouldn't, wouldn't really have much in common, but <laughs> in this regard, like we all at least agree that there are truths independent of our minds, truths that we didn't create. And so we're sort of um, allying around that principle. Gotcha, interesting. Yeah. Um, I will, one thing I would disagree with is um, I, I think it's admirable that you think that the disagreement ran um, this fundamental. It might have. There, there, there might have been a point to where you could have gotten that. I, I, felt, like, um, I felt like it was a little, more, um, a little more basic, and I feel like I run into this problem with a lot of people. Um, have you ever heard of something called like, uh, the triangle of reference, the semiotic triangle? Um, okay. Uh, may, okay, maybe not, but I'm, I'm sure you, you're familiar with the concept. It's, it's this idea, basically, that you have like, you have three different things that sometimes seem like the same thing or that. So you have like a particular, you'll have a particular thing, like, like a thing in and of itself. Um, you'll have a symbol for the thing, and then you'll have like a reference to the symbol. So I might say something like, um, like here is a word. Um, the word might be water, right? I think so that might be like um, the the symbol. Um, and then the symbol might stand for like a thought or a reference. And then that would be referring to the thing itself, like the referent. So water in this case. Um, sometimes I feel like there are disagreements over fact of the matters that people try to cash out on, but they're actually just disagreements over like a reference to a thing. So I think when you were talking to um, when you were talking to Vosh, I think you were trying to get across this idea that you you were saying H two O not to give another symbol, but I think you were trying to get at the idea that there is an underlying fact of the matter that there is a molecule that does exist that is H two O and it's existed throughout all of human history. But I think when you uttered that phrase H two O. 
Vosh thought that you were referring to that symbol and not the thing itself because he said, well, actually, not everybody agrees that that thing itself exists, but he wasn't talking about things itself. He was talking about the symbol, and then he posited they referred to it as agua down in Mexico. So he gave a different symbol. And I think you guys, I think you were operating on different levels where you were assuming that he had this like very fundamentally different view of the world where it's like, well, maybe he doesn't believe water has always existed because this is like a concept created by humans and, and, and you know that's where it comes from, and without humans, maybe it wouldn't exist. When in reality, I think that he was proposing an alternative symbol to your alternative symbol and then trying to say that that meant something different um, about the fact of the matter of the thing itself. Does that make sense what I'm saying there? Yeah, so I would have described it this way. I think yeah. that um, there are words <clears throat> mm-hmm. um, and like the, we got an English word water mm-hmm. and um, I'm not totally sure what you meant by reference to the symbol but I think it would be what um, analytic philosophers tend to call a concept. Sure. And so words express concepts. Um, that's like what the word means, you might think. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah. And so that we, we posit these concepts to make sense of the fact that in different languages, there seem to be synonyms. And so what do they have in common? Well, it seems to be the concept that they're expressing. And concepts have reference to things out there in the world, hopefully. I mean, some of them are empty, like the concept of Harry Potter, the concept of Pegasus. They don't actually refer to anything. I, but, I mean, I wouldn't say that. I don't think you'd say that, right? They refer to something, but maybe not like a fact of the matter of the real world, but they refer to the work itself, right? Mm, I don't think so. Oh, no. <laughs> I think they're literally empty names. Um, there is no Harry Potter. Strictly speaking, there is no Harry Potter. Well, wait, According what do we mean? Fiction. Yeah, what do we mean by that? I'm curious. Because obviously, when you say it, you're evoking a thought in my mind, and we're both evoking the same thought, right? What are we, what are we thinking about, if not Harry Potter? Yeah. yeah. So this is a this is a deep puzzle in in the philosophy of language. Like, what? How do empty names work? Mm-hmm. Because obviously they they seem to have a meaning, and it's one thing to talk about Zeus, and it's another thing to talk about um, Poseidon or whatever. Mm-hmm. And we recognize that like it would be natural to say we're talking about different things when we talk about Zeus and when we talk about Poseidon. Could I if but I could I like amend you, or go ahead go ahead yeah. But if you think about it, we're in each case we're not talking about anything because <laughs> there is no Zeus. And there is no Poseidon. So there's the, there's the puzzle. There's the paradox. It seems like we're talking about something, but there's nothing that we're talking about. So there's the paradox, and people spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to resolve this paradox. It, could, it, it, could it just be that we're using like a, like a language shorthand um, for something a little bit more complicated? But if we expand fully on what we're saying, then it makes sense. So for instance, when you say Harry Potter, and I hear Harry Potter, um, I would argue, well, of course, Harry Potter's a thing. We're both thinking of it. And you'd say, well, what, you know, is Harry Potter real? And I go, well, no, it's a real story. Could I not say that Harry Potter is actually shorthand for the fictional account of Harry Potter? So when you say Harry Potter, it's actually shorthand for the fictional account of Harry Potter. And I think, do we both agree that that exists? I guess so, maybe Harry Potter is not the best example because sometimes people use that mm-hmm. um, name, Harry Potter, to refer to the book series, like the Harry Potter series. Um, well, yeah, yeah, even with exists. Zeus or Poseidon, yeah, we could yeah. say like, the, like, oh, well, when I say Zeus or Poseidon, am I referring to real things? Well, we're referring to the fictional account of Zeus or Poseidon. We're referring to that, to a concept mm. that, yeah, might not necessarily refer to a real thing in the world, but it does refer to a set of stories, which I guess, I mean, I would argue that's always what it's referring to because nobody's ever seen a Zeus or Poseidon unless you're into that. But Well, here's, yeah, here's the Here's the problem, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. We're not referring to a concept. I mean, we're using the concept when we think about, um, when we think these thoughts. Okay. Um, so we're not referring to a concept. And another way to see that is Harry Potter is the kind of thing that could wear glasses and ride on a broom. But concepts cannot do that. Um, concepts are mental representations. They, they can't wear glasses. Um, so no, Harry Potter is not a concept. And also, like, I don't think we're referring to like an actual bit of a book or a bit of a story because it's the story that uses the word Harry Potter and we're wondering like when the story says Harry Potter when it uses that name what is it talking about what mm-hmm. is it what is it saying what does it refer to and it looks like it doesn't refer to anything um so yeah that's that's the puzzle we can't just say well I, you know I'm talking about the story well yeah you know you're talking about the part of the story that refers to Harry Potter and that's what we're wondering about like what is this thing that that we're referring to and it looks like there's nothing there. I feel like I would. Um, I feel like I would just always mentally cash it out as a shorthand. So, to, so let me. I guess if I throw a different example at you, um, I'm telling you right now. I have a wife. Her name is Melina. She has blonde hair and she's Swedish, right? You 
got those three parts. If you were to ever, if somebody were to ask you in the future, um, does Stephen Bonnell have a wife? And then you go, oh yeah, he has a wife. Her name is Melina, she's Swedish, she has blonde hair. Is Melina in that sense an empty word or an empty name in the same way that Harry Potter is an empty name? Because even though Melina might refer to a real person, isn't it still just a concept to you in the same way that Harry Potter is? You don't really know if she's real or not. You have no idea until you've really seen her yourself, I would imagine. Um, is it, what's, what, can you tell me the difference between somebody presenting you the account of a real person versus a fictional person? Um, yeah, how, how, do you, how do you deal with that or how do you address that in your mind? Yeah, so it would be hard to tell from my perspective now whether mm -hmm. Melina, that name, is empty or not. I'm going to take your word for it, and but it's not, it's not really up to me whether the name is empty or not. The name either refers or it doesn't, and if it does, then it's not an empty name, and if it doesn't, then it's an empty name. But um, I thought what you were going to suggest was, isn't the name Melina just shorthand for this description? Wife of Stephen, blonde, Swedish, etc. Mm -hmm. isn't, doesn't, isn't that just what the name means? And so um, I would say no, and something that um, maybe some of your viewers have are familiar, uh, maybe you're familiar with um, the work of Saul Kripke, um, but something he did, he's still alive, he's a philosopher who's still alive, something he did um, that made him pretty famous was argue very convincingly that um, proper names are not just uh, abbreviated descriptions. And uh, one quick argument for that is whatever description you associate with this name, in this case, Melina, mm -hmm. there are um, hypothetical situations, possible worlds, ways things could have been in which Melina exists, but she's not your wife, she's not blonde, she's not Swedish. Mm -hmm. So she doesn't, she doesn't match that description at all. And yet we, we still use the name to refer to her in that situation. Mm -hmm. But if the name were just equivalent to the description, then if the description doesn't fit her, the name wouldn't fit her either. But uh, so this proves they're different because the name applies to her, the name refers to her, even though the description doesn't describe sure. her in that situation. I guess so, yeah, then... names aren't equivalent to abbreviated descriptions, and so Zeus can't just mean the god who lives on Mount Olympus and is married to Hera and whatever. Gotcha. So the um. Uh, I'm just, some occasionally I'll restate what you're saying just to make sure I'm following basically um, when it comes to the name of a particular person um, the, the, the name here isn't shorthand or some abbreviated thing it's a it's an actual name that is created for a particular thing in the world that exists in the world whereas when we give like a fictional name um, we can't find that that referent that thing doesn't actually exist in the world so there's a fundamentally different thing between like the name of a real person versus the name of a fictional person right yeah okay and yeah, that's the idea. And the thought is when we utter sentences um, involving names um, in, that include names, the thought that is expressed by this sentence, what philosophers call propositions, the mm -hmm. proposition that's expressed by the sentence, um, what the name contributes to the proposition is on a certain view, and this is a little controversial, but what a, what a name contributes to the proposition is the referent. Um, and so, yeah, here's a puzzle. What about empty names? Um, they don't have anything to contribute to the proposition, and yet um, there is still a proposition there. There is still a thought. So yeah, that is the puzzle of empty names. Um, but if maybe, maybe we could just circle back to the Vosh thing. I think you had said you weren't so sure that there was this like deep disagreement about the relationship between mind and world. But um, I think I think there was because on this this view that I was calling postmodernism or creative anti-realism, the mm -hmm. view is. Um, I think if you ask them, like, what's happening with words, a, a consistent postmodernism, somebody, a consistent postmodern who's like really into Derrida um, would say, words don't refer to objects out there in the world. Words refer to other words. They get their meaning by their difference relations to other words. And so, for example, and I've, I've seen this in some of the responses to the debate, um, some people say like, well, you know, when you look up a word in a dictionary and the dictionary tells you the meaning of the word, it just gives you other words. And so really language is this self-contained sort of raft of words standing in relations to other words. And never do we leave the raft. Never do we get out of this system of language to the real world itself. 
Um, yeah, so words don't actually refer to objects out there in the world. They get their meaning from other words. Um, and I think that's the consistent postmodern view. And so that's why I thought, like, when I asked, mm -hmm. set aside the words, think about the things, you know, think about water, think about H2O, think about the stuff out there in the world. Somebody who's in the grip of this, um, in the grip of this view, is going to have a hard time understanding what I'm even asking them to do. Because all they're going to hear is talk of words. And they're going to say, you just keep talking about the word water and the word H2O. There's nothing outside of that. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, and so I think that's, that was the source of some of the difficulty at that point in the conversation. Interesting. Gotcha. So, um, uh, I, so I don't know what, what camp this puts me in. Um, I guess just so we're on the same page, if we run into this again. Um, I feel like words are in and of themselves meaningless. I think they, they like, I don't think you can build words on other words. I guess when I think of words, um, I think of, um, we all have, you know the term qualia, right? We have like um, experiences of things in the world that we can't ever truly communicate from one person to another. Um, but we might use a word to stand for a certain experience and then when we say that word, we're hoping that we're evoking the same experience in the other person's mind. Um, and I feel like that's where our language is built off of, that it requires some shared uh, experience of things in the world. So um, say, for instance, if I touch a thing that feels like nothing I've ever felt before, I'm never going to be able to communicate that to another person because they don't have that experience to, to, to map onto that. But if I touch something that's like something else, I can kind of get there um, as long as they have other experiences to build off of. So say for instance, I touch a very, 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 very soft blanket, the softest blanket ever, and I say, oh my goodness, I've touched the softest blanket in the world. Um, a question that the other person might say is, well, what is it like? And you might say, well, it's like a newborn kitten. And because they have that experience, now they can map that on to, okay, so it's the softest blanket in the world is like a newborn kitten. And if I've touched that kitten, I can build off of that shared experience. I think that's kind of how I view language, that we're uttering things in the hopes of evoking some quality that you've already experienced. But if you haven't experienced it, the, the words in and of themselves are, are completely empty and meaningless. Um, a, a more formal way of cashing this out, I guess, would be, you've heard of Mary's Red Room, I'm assuming, right? Yeah. That, Very familiar. I, and I would, yeah. I hope, I think you would say that upon seeing the color red, she is gaining some new piece of information, right? Uh, did you say Mary's red room or it's just, just Mary's room? Or my, Mary's room, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I think it's supposed to be a black and white room. Yeah, it's a black um, and white room. Yeah. Okay, but sorry, what, what were you going to say? That, about um, this thought when, when Mary sees the color red after studying it for her yes. whole life, something new is experienced, right? She's yes. gaining something, yeah. yeah. And I would say that um, I would use that as an example of like, you can never explain color to a colorblind person. You can't explain sound to a deaf person. Um, without the actual experience, there is no way to communicate. Like words can't do that. I think words are stand-ins for trying to evoke experience experiences we've already had. It's kind of how I feel. I don't know if that's a coherent view at all, or, but yeah, go ahead. No, I think um, we certainly use words to try to um, convey our thoughts to other people and to get them to think the same thoughts we're thinking. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that seems to be what we're using words for, to communicate thoughts. Uh, I mean, if we had telepathy, we wouldn't need, we wouldn't need words. <laughs> we could just like send our thoughts directly to each other. Mm -hmm. um, but absent that, the best we can do is represent our thoughts in the form of sounds or symbols on a page. We represent our thoughts and then hope that when somebody else hears that or sees that, they can have the same thought we were having. Of course, we can never be quite sure that they're thinking the same thought we're having, but that's the hope. Um, but I guess um, if the proposal was all of our words are actually naming qualities that we're experiencing, um, so that is a view that has been proposed and defended in the history of philosophy, and it's called um, phenomenalism. And those folks thought that um, in order for a word to have meaning, it's got to be um, cashed out or expressible in terms of patterns of experience. Mm -hmm. um, there's got to be some sort of pattern of experience that, um, that the word refers to. And this was actually, I think, for at least a time, maybe his whole career, I'm not quite sure, but David Hume had this view. Um, because he didn't think that we had any sort of access to um, mind-independent objects. He thought the only thing that we really had access to were our um, impressions, our experiences. And so he thought, well, then when we're talking about like trees and rocks and so on, we must be talking about patterns of experiences. 
And an example I use in my classes is it's sort of like um, when we talk about video games. Um, there, I, I haven't played video games lately, so it's going to be an old school reference. But like in Super Mario Brothers, there are coins, mm -hmm. and you can collect coins, and that's a big part of the game. Collect the coins. Um, but what is a coin in Super Mario Brothers? There, there is no literal coin there. There's, there's no precious metal there. What's a coin in the Super Mario Brothers game? It's a certain pattern of images, right? It's like this sort of rotating sort of image. Mm -hmm. That's what a coin is. And so David Hume thought, we're in the same position. Um, we're basically stuck behind this veil of experiences. And so if our words have any meaning, they must be just expressing patterns of images, patterns of impressions. So um, I don't think that's right. And um, I think that some of our words do describe sensations, like, you know, as you said, soft and warm. And, you know, we've got like expressions like the taste of banana. And, and here we're trying to just express sensations. But we've got other words for things that um, we don't actually directly experience, like, you know, words for external objects, like the Grand Canyon, I guess. There's one. <laughs> and, um, proper names, I guess, are supposed to refer to people, not sensations that we have of people. And we've got all sorts of, you know, names for numbers that we never directly experience. So no, I don't think that all words just refer to um, qualities of experience. Gotcha. Um, I guess I would, there's probably like, um, it's probably like relational words or some things there that you could find that I, I would agree with you. Like, for instance, like what, like, is a whole a thing that exists or is a whole by definition a thing that isn't, right? Um, talking about whole H O L E, like yeah, I can go dig a hole yeah. Like if I say like, oh well, there is a hole, and it's like, well, what is hole? Well, like, is that a substance or is that like a relationship between a thing, right? Yeah. Because there's because technically a hole by definition is a thing that isn't, right? Like a donut hole. Well, unless we're it's actually talking, about it. yeah, exactly, yeah, um, yeah. So <laughs> I would agree. That, there's like there's a whole literature and philosophy devoted to absences. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, I never really got into it because I, I didn't find it interesting, but it exists. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I agree there are going to be relational things. Or like when I say the word family, family is not a qualia. Um, and it doesn't stand for any qualia, right? It represents a relationship between different things. Um, yeah, there's pr probably things like that. Um, okay, I don't know how deep we don't necessarily need to go into this. I'm just making sure we're at least, under, at least I understand where you're coming from. Um, yeah, so we well, maybe I can bring it back to that triangle you mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. So it sounds like the... I mean, I come from a different tradition, and I suspect that well, uh, that um, that system comes from. Um, I think in analytic philosophy, we'd say we've got words, mm -hmm. which are you know sounds or inscriptions, um, symbols. They express concepts. Like I said, you can have words in different languages that express the same concept. You can have words in the same language that express the same concept. We've got genuine synonyms in English. We actually have a lot of synonyms in English. Um, my understanding is more than the typical language because of the history of English. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so yeah, words are expressing concepts and then concepts um, purport to refer to things. Um, and sometimes they do, uh, like the name Molina refers to something. Uh, sometimes they don't, like the name Harry Potter, but they at least aim to refer to something out there in the world. Mm -hmm. That's the way I think of things anyway. Sure. Um, so yeah, so then, um, I mean, if I had asked somebody to consider the thought that water is H2O, I'm not asking them to think about words. I'm asking You're them not to asking them to think about the... symbol or synonyms. You're yeah. asking about the fact of the matter, yeah. And I, I, I think I did that at one point in the debate. I was like, here's a sentence, water is H2O. Think about the thought expressed by that sentence. That's what philosophers call a proposition. Um, I was trying to, trying to get um, Vosh to, to think about the thought and leave the symbols behind. Mm -hmm as it were to like, you know, use the ladder to get onto the roof and then kick the ladder away. Use the sentence to glom onto this proposition that I'm thinking about and now evaluate the proposition. You don't need the sentence anymore. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, again, on this sort of postmodern view of the world, they don't think that that's the way sentences work. Sentences don't um, express any sort of extra linguistic thing. Sentences get their meaning from um, other words, their relations to other bits of the language. We never leave the language. We're sort of stuck in this prison of language. Um, if your viewers wanted to read somebody who's pretty clear, I mean, don't, I wouldn't rec... Derrida is difficult to understand. I was about to say I wouldn't recommend reading it, but give it a try. See how it goes. <laughs> but it's extremely difficult to understand. 
possibly intentionally. Um, but if you wanted to read uh, somebody who's actually pretty clear and holds this view, I would recommend Richard Rorty, um, who I, I would place kind of in the analytic tradition, but he definitely holds this view. And um, he puts it this way. He says that um, sentences are the only things that can be true or false um, because the world itself does not carve itself up into sentence-shaped chunks called facts. The world itself is just silent. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't speak in a way that could correspond to our sentences. So if I say, like, there are mountains in the distance, the world doesn't also say that, so that it doesn't match my sentence. The world doesn't scream, mountains in the distance. Um, so there's no literal match there. There's no correspondence. The world is silent. And so, if sentences are going to be true or false, um, they're made true in some other way. And his view, Richard Rorty's view, was famously or infamously, he said, truth is what my peers will let me get away with saying. That's what he said. Truth gotcha. is what my peers will let me get away with saying. So it's a sort of pragmatic theory of truth. Truth is made true by us. We're mm -hmm. the ones who make what's true, true, and what's false, false. And so, you know, once upon a time, we might have made it true that there are two genders, but it's within our power to change that. Mm -hmm. If we just stop letting people get away with saying that there are two genders, then we will literally have made it false. Okay, gotcha. Um, this, so yeah, I think that's, that's the view. This would be under that very much so the creative anti-realist viewpoint. I'm yes. Saying. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. gotcha. Um, Okay, one other question, because you've referenced it a couple of times, and I want to open a whole can of worms. Um, you believe that you can 100% gather knowledge that is external of your mind, or you have some way of accessing that? Can you talk me through how you feel that's true, or how, or how you get there? Or is this like a, we need a lot more time to do that? No, that's fine. Um, mm -hmm. I think it just depends on what you mean. You said um, your view is you can 100% gather knowledge of the mind-independent world. So if you meant, can I know things about uh, the mind-independent world, then yeah. I'm inclined to say yes. But if by 100% you meant, can you be certain about things in the mind-independent world? Well, what is knowledge then if not certainty, no? What's that? What is knowledge what if is... not certainty, no? Otherwise... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a big, that's a big question. Uh -huh. um, if knowledge does require certainty, then since we can't be certain of the external world, It'll turn out we don't have knowledge of the external world. Gotcha. So yeah, that's a real puzzle. And that's sort of the core of epistemology. Like on the one hand, um, we seem to think that we know at least some things about the world, mm -hmm. the, the world outside my mind. I know what my name is. I know that I own a car. I know where I am right now. I know that we're talking. Um, so ordinarily, we're very happy to say things like that. I know the capital of California. I, mm -hmm. I know all sorts of things. But on the other hand, we are also tempted to say that knowledge requires certainty so that if there's, you know, even uh, a shred of a possibility that is inconsistent with what you're claiming and you can't rule it out, then you don't really know that what you're claiming is true. Sure. Can I, if I can, happening. just propose just one quick alternate thing for it, and then you can keep going. Um, well, I'm not necessarily talking about like, um, like, could your car move to some like something like that, um, but more so that. Um, uh, so if I look at a table, right? Uh, my senses, I'm, I'm gathering some sense data related to the table. I believe I'm perceiving a color, a shape, a place in space. Um, what I'm asking is that, like, are are those? Am I? Am I like, I think some people would say. Um, I don't even, this might be content, I don't know, but you can't actually have knowledge of any of those things that, you know, the way that your brain interprets things and builds that concept is going to be something that might be completely untrue for a variety of reasons, or it might not refer to like a real thing. There might be some other thing going on. Um, but then I, but I've heard some other people, it sounds like you think that like, well, no, you can probably look at something and gather like real or true information about that. Or is that a distinction that doesn't matter to you? Um, does that make any sense what I'm saying there? I think, yeah, I think I understand. Mm -hmm. um, so... Yeah, here's basically the central worry of epistemology um, when it comes to knowledge of the external world. The things that we're relying on when we form beliefs about the external world are the sorts of things that could be present even in hallucination, even if we were in the matrix, even yeah. if we were um, dreaming. Um, and you called them sense data, but they go by other names. Um, contents of, ex well, just, let's just say experiences, impressions, mm -hmm. um, yeah, the sorts of things that can be present even in dreams, and they're present in hallucination, and they're present in the matrix. And so the worry is like, well, that's the only thing that I can be certain of. I, I'll, um, 
Yeah, here's how H.H. H. H. Price wrote a famous book about perception, which is called Perception. And I think the first line was, um, when I view a tomato, there is much that I can doubt. Sure. <laughs> I can, <laughs> which is one of the best opening lines. <laughs> He said he could doubt that it's really there. Um, he can doubt uh, in, it might just be an illusion or a hallucination or something like that. But he said there's one thing he can know for sure, that um, there's a red bulgy sort of image before his mind. Okay. And that's the, sense, that's the sense datum. So those are the only things that we have direct access to, our, our experiences. That's what we can be certain about. And then if you think knowledge requires certainty, then you'll worry that... Oh, I could never actually know that there's a chair in front of me or there's a cup in my hand or I'm in my car driving on the freeway right now. Mm -hmm. I can't really know that any of this is happening if you think that knowledge requires certainty. Um, but here's another way to look at things. Um, knowledge doesn't require certainty, thank goodness, because look at all these things I know that I recognize I could be wrong about. I could be wrong about my own name. I feel like I know where I was born, but I'm sort of relying on my parents' testimony there. Um, I feel like I know that I'm sitting in my living room right now, um, but I could be dreaming or in the matrix. So knowledge doesn't require certainty, thank goodness. Otherwise we wouldn't have much of it. And um, here's another thing. Um, although we are relying on reports from our eyes when we survey the world around us, we're relying on these reports that we get in the form of experiences. Mm -hmm. In other cases, we're pretty okay with relying on reports. Um, so for example, if you're watching like a sports game on TV, you feel like you can know what's happening on the sports game, in the game. Like, oh, I see that my team is winning or I see that my team's losing. Mm -hmm. But like that is very much a case of indirect perception. We're just seeing images on a screen. But the hope is like, if those images are an accurate representation of reality, then um, I am in a position to know what reality is like. Well, even on this view of perception that we've been considering, it's, it's sort of like just being stuck behind a, a monitor, stuck behind a screen, stuck behind a TV screen. Mm -hmm. um, and as long as our experiences are accurately representing reality, then we can know what reality is like. Unfortunately, you know, we kind of have to do this all with fingers crossed. Like we just kind of have to hope <laughs> that our experiences are accurately re representing reality. But if they are, then we can have knowledge of what reality is like, just like we can know what's happening in the game by watching it on TV. Gotcha. So yeah, that's that's supposed to be some optimism for you that um, you can get knowledge about the world, what the world's like. The only caveat is it's not going to be certain. Um, Interesting. Yeah, you might just have to. You might have to give up the. You might have to give up your commitment to the view that knowledge requires certainty. Okay. Do you have like um? Do people still believe in like justified true belief or are there like more exotic like theories of truth and everything now when people try to figure out like what is yeah um well that was that was a theory of knowledge mm -hmm. and uh i mean the reason that a lot of people have heard of that is um edmund gettier wrote a paper i think in 1963 where he famously gave counter examples to that um definition of knowledge mm -hmm. a definition on which knowledge is justified true belief and the story is like he just he was applying for tenure and he had to publish something so he just sent this out real quick gotcha <laughs> he was really good at generating counterexamples so he's like ah, mm -hmm. here's some counterexamples didn't think much of it but then it like totally changed the field of epistemology um because he tried to think of cases where you have a justified true belief but it isn't knowledge and just a simple case is if your clock stopped a, an otherwise reliable clock ran out of batteries and it stopped um, but you happen to look at it at just the right time, you know, a stopped clock is right twice a day. You happen to look at it at just the right time so that you get a true belief. Sure. And it looks like it's a justified true belief because as far as you know, this is a reliable clock who's never let you down. So you mm -hmm. have some good reason to trust the clock. Yeah. Um, I think in the paper, the example is like if um, Plato is running next to you, um, but you believe it to be Socrates. So you think that Socrates is running when in reality it was Plato. But Socrates is actually running somewhere, so you seem to have met the qualifications to have like the justified true belief that Socrates is running, but you don't actually know that it's based off of like a bat or whatever is the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah I don't <laughs> think that was in the original paper, but that is a that's what we would call a Gettier case. Okay, um, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, yeah. maybe this is a reference. Okay, gotcha. That's okay. Yeah, some it sounds like maybe somebody somebody came up with another case like that. There are once mm -hmm. you realize the formula, the recipe, you can generate mm -hmm. a lot of Gettier cases, and I mean it often happens that 
people get giddiered. People find themselves in giddier cases where they have a justified true belief, but it turns out um, that they were right by accident or right by luck. So the original question was, do people still accept this? Mm -hmm. um, no, I think people have been basically convinced by Gettier. There might be a couple holdouts, some, some edgelords, some contrarians who maybe want to defend the view, but uh, the majority view, virtually a consensus, is that Gettier was right and knowledge is not justified true belief. And so like the last uh, 50 years or so of epistemology has been trying to figure out what's missing. What is it that makes the difference between true belief and knowledge? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I do, I do have a view on that. Um, yeah, and I think it's right, but it's tough to tough to say that with confidence because there are so many rivals. Sure, <laughs> but yeah, I do, I do have a view on what knowledge is, um, and it's just believing something because it's true. Um, so the truth of your belief needs to figure into the explanation of why you hold the belief. So like in the case of an accurate clock, when the clock reads um, 11.55, because it is 11.55, then you end up believing that it's 11.55 ultimately because it's true that it's 11.55. But when you look at a stopped clock that stopped at 11.55 last night or whatever, um, then what's happening is you believe it's 11.55 because you looked at your clock, which reads 11.55, but your clock reads 11.55, not because it is 11.55, but because it was 11.55 last night when it stopped. And so your belief is not connected to the truth in the right sort of way to be knowledge. So that's what I think knowledge is. And um, the upshot is, to bring this back to what we were talking about, is you can have that in the case of visual perception uh, as long as the world's cooperating with your experiences, as long as... So like I believe that I'm holding a cup right now because I'm having a certain kind of experience, visual mm -hmm. experience and tactile experience. Hopefully, fingers crossed, the reason I'm having that experience is because I really am holding a cup. And in that case, the truth of my belief figures into the explanation of why I hold it. In the bad case, I would be believing there's a cup because I have this experience, but I'm having the experience because I'm being messed with by Mark Zuckerberg and I'm in a metaverse somewhere in a pod um, and he's messing with me. That would be the bad case. And in that case, I wouldn't really know that there's a cup in my hand. Gotcha. Okay. But yeah, just notice this theory of knowledge doesn't require certainty. It just requires the right sort of connection to the truth. Gotcha. I feel like the difficult part is that last part. There's a lot of difficulty that's kind of smuggled in on the, as long as it's really connected. Um, yeah. Because that, I imagine that's probably where a lot of people would fight because how do you even know that, right? Or could there be a mass delusion or some other thing? But, yeah. but okay, gotcha. I think I roughly understand. Um, yeah. Okay, just making sure we're, I'm, I'm having some level of understanding here so I can follow this conversation. Um, <clears throat> gender and uh, sex. Um, if you don't agree that they're different, you're transphobic. Okay, obviously. Um, no, I'm not gonna do that to you. So, yeah. um, let's see if I can try to not stumble any, into any of the pitfalls you go through in your paper. Um, I would say that um, Here, okay, let me ask one other question and then we get into this. Um, do you think that there can be a difference between like a thing and like the function of a thing? Um, and then here's like an example that I'll give you. Let's say that I, um, let's say that I place next to my door, I have like a long steel thing with like a sharp blade and like a handle, okay? I place it next to the door. Um, I could pick this up and swing it around in which case we might call it a sword. Or I could uh, maybe slide this in between like two metal beams and maybe we could call it some kind of like industrial nail or something, right? Um, <clears throat> and then if you're not, if you haven't figured it out, right? I'm trying to map this onto like sex and gender where there is an underlying fact of the matter about the thing. We can talk about the construction of the materials, the, the, the dimensions of it to steel pole, but the way that we would use it um, that performance of that thing might be a little bit different um, based on how it's wielded. It could be a nail or it could be a sword. Do, do you agree that there is any kind of distinction there or would you say that's like a meaningless distinction? It doesn't matter or whatever. How would, how would you 
uh, d deal with that. Yeah. Knowing so I that guess I'm, the, yeah, I'm walking this the to the point of this example was you've got like an actual physical object that could be used in different ways. Mm -hmm. And so there's a difference between the object and what it is being used for. Sure. There's a difference between the thing and how the thing functions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's certainly a difference. Um, but maybe I should just clarify my view. Um, because yeah, although, go for it. like, I, the title of the paper was Evaluating Arguments for the sex gender distinction and then i look at arguments for the sex gender distinction mm -hmm. unfortunately in retrospect i think that was misleading because that makes it sound like i think there's just one although in the introduction i i do think i like clarify what i mean um and i try to say like i'm arguing against what mari mikola calls this the standard formulation of the sex gender distinction uh, the garbage arguments <laughs> we can, or uh, i would say well, maybe you would say that, but yeah go ahead well it's just um the issue is just this the word gender is used in many different ways mm -hmm. um and so if you're if the question is is there a difference between sex and gender we would have to be clear on which sense of the word gender we're using which concept of gender is being expressed by the word in this case um, because sometimes gender is just used as a synonym for sex. True. Um, recently, I, yeah, I, I was checking into what's going on with the biological sex of starfish because I wanted to maybe use that as an example. Um, and the article I found talked about uh, the gender of starfish. And like, that's obviously, uh, it's a, that's a weird use of the word gender, but it's just using it as synonymous with biological sex. It's like a polite way of talking about biological sex. You don't have to say the word sex, which mm -hmm. some people find shocking. Sure. So or if we've ever been gender. to the hospital for a lot of the times, at least on yeah. old intake forms, sex and gender were kind of used um, indistinct. Or, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It was sort of a polite way of asking, what's your sex? Yeah. And we didn't have to use the word sex. Because it's a dirty word, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so sometimes gender just means biological sex. And then if the question is, is there a sex gender distinction? Well, obviously not, because there we're using gender to just mean biological sex, so mm -hmm. no distinction. But I think more typically um, what people have in mind when they use the word gender is they, they're, they're using it in a way that it refers either to femininity and masculinity, mm -hmm. like the sort of expectations that are associated with the sexes. Um, and in that Vosh debate, like a couple times, he, he, I think he was expressing this sort, of, this sort of view. He said, what it is to be a woman is to um, subscribe to the archetype. And then when you ask about the archetype, you get this list of ways females are. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, sometimes we just mean femininity and masculinity. And then if the question is, is there a difference between femininity and being female? and masculinity and being male. Yeah, in both cases, there's obviously a difference. It's one thing to be male. It's another thing to be masculine. It's possible to be a male and not masculine. It's possible to be a female and not feminine. You could be a male and be feminine. You could be a female and be masculine. So if that's what we mean by gender, then yeah, there is a sex gender distinction, obviously. Um, so yeah, those first two senses of the word gender it's not really controversial to say there is a sex gender distinction. What's a little more controversial and what I wrote the paper about was another use of the word gender where it's sort of the genus of these two words, man and woman, and maybe also boy and girl. And we're told what these words have in common is they're all gender terms. Mm -hmm. These are genders and maybe there are more, but there are at least this many. And so the claim then, when if you were to say there's a sex gender distinction and by gender I'm talking about men and women, then what you're claiming typically is man is not defined in terms of being male. There's no necessary connection between being a man and being male. And there's no necessary connection between being a woman and being female. That's what's being claimed in that case. And that's uh, that's the view I was um, challenging in that paper. I was I was wondering why why would people think this? What are the arguments in favor of this? And I tried to respond to all the arguments. Gotcha. Okay. Well, this is pretty boring then. Um, I should have looked for your <laughs> positive positions other than I guess for your. Ch so then, insofar as like, um, uh, insofar as that like uh, gender is. Um, well, wait, is it, is or, it boring? Ahead. I mean, well, it depends on what you think. Uh, um, or what I meant boring, what I meant, I, what I, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say boring, that's bad. When I say boring, I mean, it sounds like then we might probably largely agree with each other. Well, that's uh, what I was wondering. It depends yeah. on um, what you think the word man refers to. Um, what is the true <clears throat> definition of man? Mm -hmm. What's the analysis? What? Yeah, and that, that's what the debate is about, I guess. And similarly mm -hmm. with the word woman. Um, yeah, then I, I feel like when I think of those arguments, then I would also call those boring because I feel like... Um, I feel like that field is going to be wrought with 
normativity and not not any intelligent conversation. Um, so, for instance, like when we say, like, well, what does man or woman refer to? Um, my, the, my go-to would be is, is probably going to be contextual, right? Like if I say that like my father is a man or my mother is a woman, um, I'm probably not using like a rigid, hardcore, scientific. I've tested the chromosomes. I've seen the genitals. I know this to be 100. Right? It's probably going to be more of a contemporary layman reference to matter. Or if I go into a room full of people and I'm thinking like that's a man, that's a woman, it's going to be different than like on a doctor form or on some 23andMe test maybe. Um, but then I know a lot of people um, have very big like moral attachments to how these words are used um, such that the conversation has moved so far that people would even say that um, a trans woman is a biological female because she identifies as such um, and I, like I might agree with that but only if we've worked really hard to build out like well what do you mean when you say biological what do you mean when you say female what do you mean when you say this because at the end of the day it's I feel like all of these are going to be semantic fights um, rather than more interesting fights over the concepts themselves if that makes any sense yeah I think I understand um, just gonna write that down real quick mm -hmm. so um, you said two things and yeah go for it you don't mind if I respond really quick one thing was um you said, well, maybe the word man is contextual. If you ask me what the word man means, it's going to depend on the context. Because, mm -hmm. you know, in most contexts, if I walk into a room and say, that's a man, that's a woman, you said something like, um, I'm not testing people's chromosomes. I'm not testing I don't know, their hormones or something. So I probably don't have in mind a biological definition. So um, this is something that came up in the debate with Vosh as mm -hmm. well. And I think actually... Um, this is a very, it's a very common thought, and I saw it recently expressed by this, I don't know if you know this guy, I think he used to be at Vox, but then there was some falling out, um, Matthew Iglesias, I think is his name. Oh yeah, I've seen him on Twitter a lot, yeah. It's okay. Yeah, he, he posted something like this, like, well, obviously man or woman can't mean adult human female because, you know, we hardly ever, I don't want to misquote him, he deleted the tweet because of all the blowback he got. Mm -hmm. But what he said was something like, well, obviously man or woman can't mean anything biological because... We never test people's chromosomes and stuff. And then um, this was big in the philosophy world because um, this is just like a classic example from Kripke again. Um, it is possible that a word refers to something even though like when we use the word, we don't have its, this, is gonna, this word is gonna trigger people. We don't have its nature in mind. We don't have its, its essence in mind. And that's, that's actually the reason why I started bringing up the water h2o example with Vosh because he had said something like this mm -hmm. in his criticism of the biological definition he said like obviously we don't test people's chromosomes and whatnot i was trying to bring up water to point out that like people use the word water long before they had any idea of chemistry mm -hmm. and the whole time unbeknownst to them it referred to h2o even though they weren't like getting out their chemistry equipment and testing to see ah yes there is indeed hydrogen and oxygen here mm -hmm. Nevertheless, the word water um, referred to H2O, and that's what water always was. And so this, the way that philosophers sometimes point, put this is they say, meaning ain't in the head. Meaning ain't in the head. Mm -hmm. You might have something in your mind when you deploy a word that fixes the reference of the word. It reflects your understanding of what the word refers to. But your conception of what the word refers to may be totally mistaken. And that's why I brought up Aristotle. He used a word like water that referred to H2O, but in his mind, it, he had a mistaken conception. He thought it was an element, not a molecule. Um, something similar happens with gold. You know, people have long referred to gold and long talked about gold way before we knew about protons, way before we knew what gold was, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about gold. So something similar might be happening with words like woman, man, male, and female. Um, those words may be referring to something that is kind of obscure to us. And I said kind of, but it could be totally obscure to us. Mm -hmm. We're not even sure what this thing is. Um, nevertheless, the word refers to that type of thing. Um, and only through scientific investigation will we figure out what, we're, what we've been referring to. I'll just say one more thing really quick and then I'll yeah, stop you're talking. Good. Um, I think this is happening when physicists talk about dark matter, right? Or like dark energy. Um, they've introduced a term, a name, for something that they don't, they don't know what it is. They kind of know what it does and they have reason to think it exists, but they don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. um, but nevertheless, like this phrase, dark matter and dark energy is referring to something. We don't know what yet. 
um, and our conception of it is very crude and possibly mistaken. And only through further scientific investigation will we figure out what this stuff really is. So anyway, that's, that could be the way, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty far out example at like the boundaries of physics. And it sounds silly to compare that to the word like man and woman, but mm -hmm. that is just the way words ordinarily function. They, they have reference and what they refer to um, could vary wildly from the conception we have in our head. Gotcha. Uh, to, yeah. Okay, I'll make an analogy of this and you tell me if I understand what you're saying. So um, what you're kind of saying is that like, um, so my initial formulation was, well, if I identify that person as a man or a woman, I'm not actually testing their chromosomes or checking for genitals. And yeah. you're saying, sure, that might be true, but that doesn't mean that your concept of man or woman, the way that you identify them, doesn't ultimately, hopefully, refer to that just because you're not testing it. Much the same way that if yeah. I see a mountain and I go, oh, look, that's a mountain, um, it would be silly to correct me and say, well, hold on. Um, that's like it's hollow, just the image of the mountain. You haven't gone there and checked it, right? It could be yeah. a giant board that is using a trick to think, right? You don't know. That's like, well, okay, well, maybe. But I mean, yeah. I still think it's a mountain that's made of rock and everything, right? You're kind of saying that? Yeah, <laughs> and uh, maybe a better example is gold. Because like when we identify gold, rarely do we actually do like a chemical analysis. We just look for shiny, lustrous, soft, yellow metal. Mm -hmm. um, those are the those are the typical appearances of gold that we use, and we realize like this is fallible because there's fool's gold. Sometimes we might make mistakes, um, so we're just using sort of typical appearances that we think are good indicators of the presence of real gold, recognizing we may be wrong. Um, similarly, when we <clears throat> classify people as men and women, mm -hmm. um, or as males and females, we rely on um, characteristic appearances or typical appearances realizing full well that you know we may occasionally make mistakes mm -hmm. um, but that's not to say that the word man just means these appearances mm -hmm. the word woman just means these appearances no just like in the Molina case like you might have a conception of Molina in your mind wife blonde Swedish um, but that's not what the name means the name actually means it refers to that person Gotcha. Although you rely on sort of typical appearances in order to use the name, that's not what the name actually means. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The second thing you had said was, um, and this one I think is more pertinent, you said, uh, well, in this area where people are having debates about what the meaning of the word woman is and so on, uh, it seems like there's there are a lot of moral considerations, um, and it's just a semantic fight, you said. Mm -hmm. And I think that's right. So um, this one paper of mine that you read, that evaluating arguments for the sex gender distinction, that was devoted to a certain kind of person um, who's engaged in a particular kind of project. And I tried to make it clear in the paper. It was for people who think that the dictionary has always been wrong. Women, that word woman, never actually referred to adult human females. And dictionaries do make mistakes, especially with philosophical terms if you look them up, sure. look them up in a dictionary dictionaries are and horrible. i don't know if you figured this out but in, in the internet if anytime you're having a debate with somebody over some pretty heavy or really all philosophy topics are heavy whenever somebody pulls out a dictionary definition that conversation <laughs> is completely and totally over yeah. um yeah but okay yeah go ahead yeah so i try to be yeah we don't <laughs> so i do appeal to the dictionary sometimes but i try mm -hmm. to say like dictionaries are fallible this doesn't settle the issue but yeah. Or any academic topic. If you're having like a big yeah. econ, macro econ argument, it's like, well, if I look at inflation in Merriam Webster, it says it's yeah, like, okay, well, right. this conversation is fucking over. So, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 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 Um, so not to say, say like, I'm sorry, not to say that referring to a dictionary is always bad. I didn't mean to say it like that, but it, the oftentimes yeah. things will get absurd very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> maybe we'll come back to the dictionary issue later on. But mm -hmm. um, shoot, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. So I was directing this project to a particular kind of person who thinks like, it is just a mistake to think that the word woman has ever referred to adult human females. It's always referred to something else, like a social role or, or something else. Mm -hmm. um, and they give arguments for that conclusion. And so I was looking at those arguments in that paper. But I wrote a second paper um, called Some Internal Problems for Revisionary Gender Concepts. And so there I had in mind the people who self-consciously admit, they're, they're aware of the fact that the word woman as typically used in dominant mainstream contexts expresses a concept that refers to adult human females. Mm -hmm. um, so they admit that's, that's how things have been going. Um, but they think this is a problem and it should be rectified, should be remedied, should be ameliorated as uh, we talked about in that debate. Um, and so they're very aware and intentional about the fact that 
they want to use the old word woman, but they want to express a new concept. Mm -hmm. Or the way they might put it is they want to engineer the old concept and change it so that it no longer refers to adult human females, but it refers to something else. Mm -hmm. So there's an open question. Do, are they changing the old concept so it has a new referent or are they just introducing a new concept? It doesn't really matter for our purposes. But they are aware of the fact that some engineering is going on here. Mm -hmm. Some revision is going on here. And they're explicit that they're doing it for moral reasons. Yeah. Because they think this will advance the cause of social justice. This will advance the cause of feminism. And so, as I said in the Q&A of the debate with Vosh, I think that um, Vosh is engaged in this sort of thing, or at least uh, mm -hmm. when made aware of this distinction, I think Vosh would agree, like, yes. And I think that's what he means when he says, like, all definitions are prescriptive. Yeah, I've, I've I think what he means is, is that basically we should just make all yeah. the words mean the things that we want to make ourselves feel yeah. the best as we can. Have you, are, do you have you ever read, do you know who C.S. Lewis is? Do I know who C.S. Lewis is? I'm very familiar it's with very, that. Have you read Mere Christianity? Yes. It no, reminds me a lot of um, in the beginning when he talks about the, the word gentleman. Okay. How the definition... I don't remember a conversation of gentlemen, but... Okay. It, but it's at, changed? Um, yeah, basically that gentleman used to refer to a man with land and I think a coat of arms. And eventually through time, gentlemen came to refer to a nice man. Um, and I think he talks about how this is like, it's bad to destroy terms like this because eventually what language does is words just convey an author's feeling about a thing and it doesn't actually convey any more meaning in and of itself. Um, such that now when people say gentlemen, we don't gain any new information, but instead we've destroyed the word gentleman and now we've just used that word to mean, I like this person. Um, <laughs> and that when you walk forward with this, it seems like people wanna do this sometimes with a lot of language to wear. Um, not to give anything about my views of trans people, but people say like, well, we should refer to them as women or men. I was like, well, why? It's like, well, because we don't hate trans people. And it's like, well, okay, but like, do we have to change all the definitions of all the words to show that we don't hate a group of people? Like, is that, that seems like kind of a strange way to go about um, constructing language, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting. I want to go back and read that little passage of Lewis, but um, just to make clear my own view, mm -hmm. um, well, it sounds like what Lewis was saying was in this case, we have a change in language that cost us something. We sort of yeah. lost something. Um, language has gotten worse in a certain respect. Mm -hmm. we've, we've lost some expressive power that we used to have. Mm -hmm. And that and can even... definitely happen. Yeah. I, I was going to say that. Like, oh, yeah, go I was going to say that English has been, at least the grammar of English was vastly simplified. I, my understanding is largely by the Vikings who were like learning it as a second language and they just brutally tore it down to its bare essentials. And we, we lost a lot of cases and we lost some expressive power, mm -hmm. um, but it became much simpler. Um, but there might be cases like that where language has changed and lost something valuable. Mm -hmm. But I think that there are other ways in which our language has changed that have been improvements for sure. Like how could anyone argue with that? For sure. um, we've introduced new terms, we've introduced new distinctions, we've borrowed words from other languages that have been very useful. And so um, I don't, yeah, I don't want anyone to think my position is just like anti-change in language because that's not the case. Um, I'm yeah. totally open to the idea that certain changes in language are beneficial. And I, I found myself doing this um, when my daughter was young, we would read stories um, like children's books and some of them were from a long time ago. Mm -hmm. and um, one book I was reading with her just often used words like fireman and policeman. Mm -hmm. This is just a small example. But um, although like, I wouldn't consider myself woke by any means, um, I, I found myself changing the word <laughs> when I read it to her. Because I realized that if she just hears fireman, policeman, she will be, it, it will be excusable. A yeah, she's going to get the message like this is a profession just for men. Mm -hmm. Even though I don't think that's literally entailed, but um, that's certainly suggested. And so I would change it to firefighter and police officer. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a kind of change in language that I think has been beneficial and good. So my objection to revisionary gender concepts isn't that they're revisionary. I think it's okay to um, borrow old words, express new concepts, and mm -hmm. this could be a genuine improvement. My worry was just... Um, all of these proposals for what the word should mean now, for what concept should be expressed by these words, it looks like they're failing to live up to the standards of these philosophers themselves because the primary standard was whatever definition we come up with, better respect everybody's self-identification. Mm -hmm. So if, you're a, if you identify as a woman, 
So we're coming up with a new revisionary definition of woman. It's not going to be adult human female. It's going to be something else. And a constraint on the project was it better turn out that if somebody identifies as a woman, they meet this definition. Yeah. And anybody who meets this definition better identify as a woman. We don't want like trans men to meet the definition. We don't want non-binary individuals to meet the definition because they don't identify as women. Mm -hmm. So that was like a constraint on the project. It needs to map onto everybody's self ID. And um, I guess the, the, the drum I keep beating in my papers is this is impossible. We got to stop doing this because there's no property that you could describe. There's no definition you could come up with that's going to pick out a property that somebody's going to have if and only if she identifies as having it. Mm -hmm. That's impossible. There's no property like that. Um, the circularity is kind of absurd. You're not at some point. You're no longer yeah. expressing anything. I would say it's like a well, destructive he, change in language. Like if you are what you identify yeah. as, then you could literally identify as anything. But the identification as such, since it has no other requirements besides the identification yeah. of it, then it means nothing. Yeah. Well, well, here's something I've discovered, and I'll try to convey mm -hmm. it. But it's a little bit. It's difficult for me to express because it's still kind of new to me. But um, here's something I discovered. Uh, working in this area, like I've had to think more about what's wrong with circular definitions than I ever had had to think about it before in my life. Like, used to be in philosophy, you'd just say that definition's circular, and everyone would agree, ah, oh, yes, that is bad, let us fix it. Um, okay. But in this literature, um, people are kind of like resisting it. They're like, well, what's so what's wrong with that? Uh oh, tell me what's wrong with a circular definition. The most so irritating part is they give the definition of like, well, you can have any name you want, can't you? I hate that yeah. concept, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we can. Yeah, I was I was going to propose that we think of like potential counterexamples in a second. But uh -huh. um, here's the distinction I was going to make. Um, so this is certainly a, a problem. If you try to communicate to me this revisionary definition, you say, "Hey, I came up with a new concept to be expressed by the word woman. I think we should pick out a different set of properties, not being adult, being human, and being female. I want to pick out a different set of properties with the word woman." And I say, "Okay, what properties are these?" Oh, it's the property of identifying as a woman in the very same sense that I came up with. So now you were trying to tell me the sense that you came up with, but you use the word that like I didn't understand yet mm -hmm. in your description of what these properties were. So definitely that's not going to help me understand what, the, what this property is mm -hmm. because of the circularity. So as a certain kind of performance, it's going to fail. The performance was, I will communicate to you the meaning of this word. Um, that failed because of circularity. But I think the issue is a little more complicated than that because um, it is possible for a word to get a meaning in another way. Um, so, I mean, most of the words, when most of the words we have, when we learn them, we weren't given a set of necessary and sufficient conditions for their application. That's actually pretty rare. Most of the words, when we learn them, we learn them by pointing. You know, our, our mother, or our father, or our siblings would say like, uh, wall, chair, cup and so on. Mm -hmm. And so we were never given a list of necessary and sufficient conditions, but somehow we acquired the concept and we, we came to grasp it and we competently use it. Okay. Um, so here's the, here's the little wrinkle in this conversation. It could be that somehow a woman has a meaning in these trans inclusive and queer communities. It doesn't mean adult human female. It means something else. When we ask what it means, we don't learn because of the circular. We can't be told because of the circularity. But maybe it means something nonetheless. OK, so that's the difficult part that kind of hard to understand. A word can have a meaning that cannot be conveyed to you, at least through necessary and sufficient conditions. And maybe, uh, maybe a good example is one you brought up earlier with like colors, trying to communicate what a color is to a colorblind person. You, you, you can't do that. You can't convey it in words. But nevertheless, like our color words do have a meaning. And we know what they mean but we can't convey it to somebody who hasn't already seen the colors. Okay, so similarly, in these trans-inclusive and queer communities, the word woman may have a meaning, and it may just be that they're having a hard time communicating it to people who aren't already initiated in this um, name-using practice. Okay, but now here's a further claim. Okay. Uh, someone's a woman in these communities, if and only if she identifies as a woman. We don't know, or at least I am not sure what woman means in this sentence. Someone is a woman if and only if she identifies as a woman. I'm not sure what woman means, but I think I'm still in a position to know this can't be true. Whatever woman means, um, 
there's just there's no feature you could have there's no property you could have if and only if you identify as having it because like it's possible to have a property and miss it miss that you have it not notice it mm -hmm. possible to think you have a property and lack well it. unless the property is just the identification itself right which yeah, seems so, to be the argument oh no yeah. B buckle up um so the proposal was um maybe i should write it down s is a woman if and only if s identifies as a woman i don't know if you can see this but um we're told there's this property mm -hmm. being a woman mm -hmm. can you see that <laughs> okay I, I write down things uh, as you talk to but yeah i see i see what you're saying yeah Okay, so S is a woman, if and only if, oh, so IFF is if and only if, um, S identifies as a woman. Mm -hmm. And then um, we're told, well, here's what it is to be a woman. It's to identify as a woman. That's what you should really put in there. Mm -hmm. So set aside the circularity where we're still not sure what that means. Sure. Then what this if and only if claim is saying is S is someone who identifies as a woman, if and only if S identifies as someone who identifies as a woman. So we would have this little iteration here. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So... And that would still be false. That would still be false. So even if you tell me... Oh, that would still be... Oh, hold on. Now you're, you're stretching my, <laughs> the little bit of prop logic I know. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. So well, you're using so, some sort of logical transformation over that I'm assuming is going to hold true in every other prop logic case, but you're saying here it seems to break the example. Can you yeah, yeah, yeah. walk me through yeah, that let me one more time? You here. here's, a, here's a simple example. So like, um, mm -hmm. I think I used this in a debate. Being tall. Yes. So think about that feature. Mm -hmm. Is it true that someone is tall if and only if... She identifies as being tall. Okay. Obviously not. You can be tall and not identify as being tall. You can identify as being tall and not be tall. Sure. So, so that's the simple case. Now, this is, this is going to be a bit of a mind cracker, but suppose somebody says, what about this um, feature? Could be identifying as a woman, but let's use a simpler case, identifying as a Packers fan or something like that. Just some, some way you might identify. Okay. Identifying as Californian. Let's do that. Identifying as Californian. So that's a feature that I have. I identify as Californian. So now what we're wondering is, is it possible to identify as Californian without um, having this feature? Identifying as identifying as Californian. So that's why it's difficult to evaluate. Um, maybe I should write it down. Why? So uh, you're saying that it's if you identify as a Californian... Is that just give me the give me the raw logic, I guess, instead of Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, that maybe. I don't know if you can see this, but Okay, so here's the general form of the principle that we're trying to consider. Okay. So in the brackets you just put whatever feature you want. Okay. And we're wondering, is there anything I could put in these brackets that would make this biconditional true? Um, if and only if statement. So the if and only if means if this, if the left side is true, the right side is true. Okay. Also, if the right side is true, the left side is true. That's what if and only if means. It's like an equal sign. Okay. Is this like the, way. is this the formalized prop logic version of the principle of explosion? Is that what we're? No. No, this isn't. Okay. Gotcha. All right. No. Keep ignoring everything I'm saying. Keep going. This is just like a proposal. We're told um, there's a feature that <clears throat> would make this sentence true. Okay. There's some property or characteristic you could put in this bracket. Mm hmm such that somebody has the feature if and only if the person identifies as having it. Okay. Okay, so we did it the simple case with like being tall. Okay. What if I put tall in there? Mm -hmm. Then the sentence is S is tall if and only if S identifies as tall. And we're like, oh wait, that's false. No, that's, it's not true that you're tall if and only if you identify as being tall. Okay, and then um, people propose other examples like, um, well, maybe we should. Well, isn't that because, hold on, I'm just trying to... Um... Because I'm worrying that the reason why these are breaking down have nothing to do with the logic, but more to do with what we're putting in the brackets. So, like the tall thing doesn't work because we're we escape the equation and we appeal to some like like external prop logic thing. Whereas if we're being strictly logical, like if we say that woman is by definition somebody that only def only identifies as a woman, if you plug that in there and that is the definition, why doesn't that work, or why would that not work? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I don't think the problem is. Um the feature that we put in there. The problem is that just what's going on on the left side is mm -hmm. different from what's going on on the right side. It's one thing to be a certain way. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to identify as that way. Well, no but isn't what that just, is. what if what if being the certain way yes. was identifying as a certain way, yeah. Yeah, so put it in here. Okay. Put identifies as a woman in here. Okay. And then what the sentence is saying is, 
Could it be the case? Well, let's not do identifies as a woman. Can we just do identifies as tall really quick? Sure. And then maybe we'll work our way up to identifies as a woman. Okay. I, the only reason I, I don't like the tall is because tall has yeah. properties that are clearly like, oh, like a tall, like a six foot five person. That person is tall. Whereas the yeah. woman thing is obviously that's the, what is the contention here, right? Not between yeah. you and me, but what the contention would be between other people. Yeah. So, well, well, how about just, just, yeah. I just, I just want to use a word that like, we're all clear on what it means. And if you don't like tall, maybe you're, but you're looking for something that's more like, as people say, an identifier or something like that. Um, a gamer. Like How about being, a gamer? How about a gamer? Can we do that? Okay. Being game. Being a gamer. Being a gamer. Being a Californian. Being feminine. Let's do being a gamer. Mm -hmm. um, can you just tell me really quick so I make sure I understand what is a gamer? That's somebody who what, identifies what a as a gamer. <laughs> is, it, is it though? <laughs> well, it kind of is because some people say I play my cell phone for it. Well, because now my worry is when you ask that, you're the reason why the logic is starting to break down now has nothing to do with the actual logical statement. It has to do with like our kind of the external baggage that we're bringing in to to the statement. Like somebody might say like um, like oh like um, one plus one equals three, and you're like, well, what do you mean by one plus one equals three? That doesn't make any sense. Like oh, well, because when two sheep come together, three can leave because they had a child. It's like, okay, oh well, I guess, but that doesn't really have anything to do with one plus one equals three. That has to do with like yeah. external content being brought in, much the same way that like somebody saying that they identify as being tall, um, but we can see that doesn't work because just because somebody identifies as being tall doesn't mean that they necessarily are tall. Well, yeah, kind of, but the problem here is we're talking about a definition that is literally circular, right? Like the tall thing doesn't seem to be a circular definition. The, the identifying as a woman thing does seem to be circular, which changes, I, I, or it feels like to me it changes how the, the logic would work because of the external content of the definition, not because of the logic itself breaking down. But I could be wrong on that. Yeah, well, um, we can go with the gamer one if you want. Sure, go, um, okay, go for it. I just, I just, I mean, people have proposed this okay. before. I think maybe even Vosh has proposed this as an example of a term that's defined in terms of self-identification. But I don't mm -hmm. think that's right. If you just let's sure. start with this. I know this isn't the example you wanted, but what if we put that's gamer fine. in there? Sure. S is a gamer. Mm -hmm. Is it really true that someone's a gamer if and only if he identifies as a gamer or she identifies as a gamer? <clears throat> Couldn't somebody identify as a gamer, even sincerely, but just misunderstand what it is to be a gamer? And couldn't there be someone who's a gamer, but is so um, immersed in the game and so obsessed with the games that mm -hmm. he, he or she has never taken the time to reflect on the fact that he's a gamer or that she's a gamer and doesn't identify as a gamer? Yeah, I mean, I would say that's true. But, that, but, but I think that's the issue. This is the subject of the debate when it comes to woman or man, like the content is has been completely removed and it's just if you idea as such because because okay. i've explored okay. these conversations even more formally with some of these people and they will literally tell you and this is why the recursiveness and the circularity is silly they'll say like you can never be wrong whatever you identify as you always are and there are no incorrect statements insofar as your identification goes and there's no external way to validate or invalidate it. So anybody yeah. can li literally identify as, some people will say as anything, but we'll say anybody can identify as man or woman, and just by them having the thought, they're automatically correct about it. But that's because man or woman, all of the content has been removed from what those are, and it's been reduced only to a self-ID thing, I think is the issue. Yeah, well, I think what we're talking about now is very relevant to that, because mm -hmm. what I'm trying to prove is that can't possibly be right. <laughs> Unless what they mean is, well, when I'm identifying as a woman, what I'm doing is like attributing a certain English word to myself. Um, but that, but it seems to be the case. You it, you say that like that's unsatisfying, and I would agree well, with you. But the problem is, has, yeah, the problem is, I think if you push anybody on that, I think they'll say it because if you because when you this is kind of this well, <laughs> this is actually the drama right now with the whole what is a woman because nobody wants to give any content to that word at all. They don't want to give any qualifiers or anything. Um, even even whether you're talking about sex or gender, um, Vosh used that term a few times, hormone wash or whatever, where he was saying, well, even biologically, a woman can be anything. It's all arbitrary. Or other people will say in terms of the gender performances, a woman or a man could do anything. So it does feel like people really truly do want it to be just a word, which I think goes back to the thing that I originally said was, I feel like circularity is bad. Um, because it 
becomes meaningless. If something is circular, by definition, then you've it, it doesn't convey a thought, right? It almost becomes like a, a private word of sort. Like, oh, like I'm a gazumba vibe, and it's like, what is a gazumba vibe? Um, well, you know, it's like we gazumba vibe. That's just what we do. And it's like, okay, well, this means absolutely fucking nothing to me because you've given me nothing. Yeah. It's circular. I, I, it doesn't mean anything. You might as well not have the word. Is the issue that I kind yeah. of yeah. Okay. Well, let me just wrap one thing up with this. Yeah, go for it. Yep. And we can talk about um, what if we define self-identification in terms of attributing a word to yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I do want to come back to that really quick, but yeah, go for um, it. just to put a little bow on this one. So I think we agree that being a gamer isn't just a matter of self-identification because a gamer may fail to identify as a gamer and somebody may misidentify as a gamer. But let's put now in this bracket, identifies as a gamer. Okay. Well, I'll just write this, IDs as a gamer. Then the sentence we're evaluating is, is it the case that someone identifies as a gamer if and only if the person the person identifies as and now what we have to put in this bracket is the same thing we put in here mm -hmm. and so we need to wonder is it possible to identify as someone who identifies as a gamer mm -hmm. and what is the what's the problem what's the logical problem with that statement yeah, yeah. well I wouldn't describe it as a logical problem I would just say it's it's broadly logically impossible <laughs> because um it's and this is this is the part that's kind of hard to think through because we're like two levels into this now but we'd have to ask could someone identify as someone who identifies as a gamer without actually identifying as a gamer or in the other direction could someone identify as a gamer without identifying as someone who identifies as a gamer and i think there it's that's probably the clearest kind of example would you, you not see that even if you don't form even if you don't like verbalize it or do it like like casually um, would would the argument not be that you're logically committed to the infinite regressive or recursive identifications by by uttering one or no? That like even if you don't well, say it, you're kind of logically committed to it. Maybe, but I mean, what we have going on here on the right side is like an actual like mental act. You need to actually do something in order to satisfy this right side of the bike conditional. You need to identify in a certain way, form a certain belief. Um, yeah, and so <clears throat> couldn't you meet someone who you ask them? Um, are you a gamer? They say yes. And you're like, okay, so they ID as a gamer. Mm -hmm. And now you ask them, have you ever identified as someone who identifies as a gamer? I know you identify as a gamer, but have you identified as someone who identifies as a gamer? And wouldn't, wouldn't it be totally possible for someone to say like, no, I guess I've never done that because that's like an insane thing to do. <laughs> I mean, like they could, they could say that, but then I feel like you could come in and say, well, you, in, in a way, like you, you're logically committed to that. No, like. Um, if I don't somebody think says, logically committed to it. Are, like if somebody says, like, um, like, do you think that you've ever been to, Cal uh, um, do you exist in California? And somebody's like, mm -hmm. yeah, I exist in California. And it's like, okay, well, um, do you, fuck, how can I, fuck, I don't, hold on, I'm, I suck at this. Um, like somebody, could you, could you theoretically say like, um, well, in order to exist in California, you also have to exist to the planet Earth. And have you thought about existing on Earth before existing in California? And it's like, if you haven't, can you say you exist in California? Like, it feels like that, that statement of like, I identify as a gamer logically would entail identifying as somebody who identifies as a gamer like it feels like that's it's logically entailed in it which would then in, like that but i could i guess i could just be wrong well, there but it feels like it, you well, kind of committed to it yeah. maybe we should just go back to the simpler case real quick and maybe mm -hmm. we agree that like being californian doesn't logically entail that you identify as being californian you maybe you should if you're rational and you mm -hmm. and you're omniscient um, but there are, there are ways that I am that like I don't identify as being because there are many ways that I am that I just don't know that I am that way. Like maybe it's possible. Uh, this is, I don't know why this came to mind. This is kind of dark, but <laughs> I might have a tumor growing in me right now, right? Okay. Like that's the way cancer works. <clears throat> and so maybe I'm the kind of person who has a cancer, but I don't identify that way because I'm just not aware of it. Um, yeah, that, that was kind of a dark example. Sorry to dampen the mood. Um, but maybe there are other... Other examples of ways you are. I guess like the, the that statement. I don't know if we're getting lost in levels, and I might be. But um, the um, so like you're saying they're like well maybe if they're rational. I mean like if I'm evaluating logical statements, I'm always assuming that like everything plugged into the statement is perfect, ra perfectly rational. Um, so it, it like it feels like it. Yeah, I, I guess I feel like you're. I yeah, I feel like you're logically committed to it. I don't like. I, I don't know if I can get out of that mentally. I might be. That might be my prison. <laughs> Um, that somebody that identifies as a gamer necessarily is somebody who identifies as somebody that identifies as a gamer. Even if you don't have that thought or think it, 
you're, you're just kind of logically committed to the position by the first position you've taken. Um, you might be personally irrational or you might not conceive of that, but you have performed that like logical action um, by virtue of the first thing you've done. It seems to be the case. Yeah. So yeah, I don't think there is that entailment. It's mm -hmm. no matter what property you have, there's no guarantee that you're going to identify as having that property. If only because there are properties you have that you just don't know about. Um, but I don't even think that having a property entails that. Um, yeah, you should identify as having it. But um, or, I guess what you said was if you identify as a gamer, then what's entailed is you are someone who identifies as someone who identifies as a gamer. Is that what you said? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I, don't know, I feel like I'm getting kind of lost now too, but... Um, <laughs> That's all good. Hope, is, is the I, reason why this biconditional breaks is because the thing we're putting in the box is you identify as, or would we, if we put anything in this box, does it break the biconditional? That can't be the case, right? I think it breaks not because of what goes in the box and not because there's any logical impossibility here. It's just because over here on the left side, we just have a claim about how you are. Okay. S is just standing for any subject. I hope that was clear. Okay. <laughs> S is for any subject. So here we're just talking about how you are. Okay. And here <clears throat> we talk about how you identify. And those are just two different things. It's one thing to be a certain way. It's another thing to identify as being that way. Identifying is like an extra step. It, it requires noticing that you're that way, maybe believing that you're that way. Oh, hold on. Wait, I, I just had a fucking Jimmy Neutron. Okay. Okay. I, okay. I, maybe maybe I'm coming along a little bit more. I kind of understand what you're saying. Um, I'm going to try to rephrase this. So if I say that in order to be a thing, oh, oh my God, my brain just expanded three sizes. If I say that in order to be a thing, I must identify as the thing, then the problem is that in order to be that thing, I must identify as that thing. And in order to be that thing, I'm expanding the brackets, I have to identify as that thing. You're basically, you, the, the condition that you've created is that, well, if you wanna say that in order to be X, you have to identify as being X, that means that in order to be that person that identifies as X, you have to identify as the person that identifies. And these are things that it doesn't seem like we're ever actually doing, nobody's actually doing this. So the biconditional breaks the first statement. Is that kind of right or? Um, yeah. Th that's the way I think you were thinking about it, and that might be right. It might be launching you on like a super task. It might be requiring that you have <clears throat> infinitely many identifications and you could never actually do that, and nobody really does that. But I was just pointing out that um, even if it doesn't launch that kind of infinite regress and require you to complete a super task, mm -hmm. require you to complete an infinite number of tasks, again, if you just think about like the ordinary case, it's, well, just let's switch from identification to maybe some other kind of mental state you could have mm -hmm. like desiring. Imagine somebody proposed that there's a property you can have if and only if you desire as you desire to have that property. Okay. And there, I think, well, I don't think there is any property like that. Um, it's one thing to be tall. It's another thing to desire to be tall. It's one thing to be Californian. It's another thing to desire to be Californian. Um, so I think the same thing happens no matter what mental state we put in there. Um, identification, believing, desiring, intending. It's just, the fact is, it's one thing to have a property. And then it's just a different thing to perform this mental action. Okay, of I, okay. I think I understand it. more too. So I think my issue earlier might have been as well that I was trying to cash out identifying as like a subconscious thing that you do. And it just is, that's what I meant when I said logically yeah. entail. Whereas you're saying that identification is kind of an extra step that we don't seem to do yeah. all the time. And that's where maybe the difference was. Yeah, so I think if it is a subconscious thing, we might launch this infinite regress, and then pretty soon people's brains are just going to run out of space, and they can't sure. like, identify as infinitely many things. <clears throat> but maybe another way to see the problem, um, I mean, here's how I originally saw it. Um, mm -hmm. I just noticed that all the de revisionary definitions that were being proposed by trans-inclusive philosophers, they, they all had a flaw. They, um, they all excluded some trans women and or included some trans men or included some non-binary individuals just no matter what definition these philosophers came up with they couldn't draw the boundaries just right so an example that i used in the debate was the that social role view according to which to be a woman is to occupy a certain position in society uh -huh. maybe you uh, yeah crude example i don't know you you wear dresses or something like that uh -huh. or a more sophisticated more sophisticated example is you are oppressed along some dimension because you are observed or imagined to be female. Uh -huh. That was Sally Haslinger's view. 
Now, what kept happening is people pointed out counterexamples, like, couldn't somebody be a trans woman, identify as a woman, but be assigned male at birth? Couldn't somebody be a trans woman and yet not occupy this position? Um, this is like the happened. classic kind of turf argument that they would argue that trans women in some ways are trying to reap some of the benefits of identifying as a woman, but they hadn't experienced the prior oppression oh. that would give them. That's like a, no, I'm sorry, when I yeah. said turf, I didn't mean to make it bad. Uh, that's like a, but that, that would be one of the arguments that they give for why it's a little bit unfair for a trans woman to identify as such without that shared history of oppression. Yeah. It's like one argument I've heard. Yeah. Well, you know, I hear what you're saying, but I think that's a, a different definition. I was just surprised when you said turf argument, because actually the sort of objection that I just gave to that social worldview has mm -hmm. been given by other trans inclusive philosophers and it's kind of an objection from the more progressive position like this revisionary definition is not progressive enough okay um, sure. because it excludes some trans women um but I, I agree there's like another definition that is kind of similar that i think um for example eleanor burkett famously or infamously proposed at least at one time in a new york times editorial not not so many years ago and the definition was to be a woman, you have to have had certain sorts of life experiences. Mm -hmm. um, you have to have suffered certain indigni indignities, she said, and relished certain courtesies. And what she had in mind was like being catcalled. That's one of the indignities. One of the courtesies is maybe having doors open for you. But the idea was being a woman is a matter of having certain experiences. Mm -hmm. And then her conclusion was um, trans women have, at least not all of them, um, have had the right sort of experiences in order to be women. Um, but Eleanor Burkett was willing to like accept that implication. Um, so yeah, I guess when you said a turfy kind of argument, you had it, that in mind. But just going back to the oppressed on sex marked grounds one, that's a, a very old definition. I think Gail Rubin proposed it, Sally Heslinger proposed it, but just recently it has been pointed out that this is gonna exclude some trans women. Um, and I think it's, I mean, what I came to find out is we're just kind of doing this thing again. We're pointing out that somebody could identify as a woman mm -hmm. without meeting this proposed definition of woman. You could identify <clears throat> as a woman without occupying the right position in society, without being oppressed on sex marked grounds. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I mean, Sally Heslinger gave up her view because of this sort of objection. Um, a similar kind of thing happened to Judith Butler. Judith Butler is famous for saying like gender is a certain kind of performativity. You regularly and for the most part present in a certain way, perform in a certain way. So people have pointed out that, you know, not all trans women do that. And there may be some, you know, trans femme non-binary people who present in a feminine way um, regularly and for the most part, but don't identify as women. And so Judith Butler, won't your definition from the 90s exclude some trans women, include some non-binary individuals. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is Judith Butler has conceded that and abandoned this definition that made her famous. Um, in favor of like respecting everybody's self ID, but again, I think what's happening here is we we've just we've realized through trial and error that whatever definition we put in there isn't going to co-vary with identifying as a woman. Um, so that's what we keep noticing. And so yeah, my most recent paper, why the trans inclusion problem cannot be solved. Um, th that this is why it cannot be solved. <laughs> It's because um, there's this constraint placed on any definition of woman. It's going to need to respect everybody's self-identification, but that's impossible. Inevitably, there will be counterexamples. Yeah. It will be possible. Insofar as you've said that, like, it's sufficient to only identify as a woman to be a woman, you're always going to break. Yeah. Yeah. And um, importantly, I mean, that is the sort of standard definition of uh, a trans woman, somebody with a female gender identity, somebody who identifies as a woman, yeah, it was assigned male at birth. Um, I saw, like, online in the wake of this debate, some people seem to have in their minds that the definition of a trans woman is just a woman who was assigned male at birth. But just for what it's worth, like, that's not, I don't think that's the standard definition. That's not the way the American Psychological Association <coughs> defines it. That's not the way the Human Rights Campaign defines it. Well, But maybe would, that's the next step. That might be the next step in the potentially, conversation. Potentially. <clears throat> I would be careful on the psychological grounds that um, uh, earlier you challenged me when I said, when we evaluate if a person is a man or a woman, um, we don't do a chromosome or a genital check. And you might say, sure. That might be true, but you are doing the only check you essentially can, and you're assuming that it's connected to 
that underlying concept of like, you know, the fact of the matter of like chromosomes or genitals, right? It could be the case that somebody could use self ID not because they think that self ID is what makes them a man or a woman, but psychologically because that's the only way they can access the information of if they are a man or a woman internally or something, right? That could be the case, like in yeah. a similar sense. Yeah, it might be like a reliable but <clears throat> fallible indicator of whether yeah. you're a man or a woman. Like for all mental health, for instance, like we might say for like yeah. depression or anxiety, if we exclude external behaviors, we're trying to get to mental states that can't be measured, so we shortcut it with questions. Yeah. We wouldn't say that you are depressed because you identify as being depressed, but the identification of those thoughts are the only way we can figure out if you are depressed. So in a way, we're kind yeah. of saying it, but not really, right? Yeah. Um, so I think, I mean, w my sense of what's happening in the in the debate, in the in this cultural debate we're having is, it seems like some people are willing to entertain the possibility and they're starting to explore a certain bit of territory according to which self-ID is not infallible. It is fallible. Oh, okay. So it's that seems possible. like a scary position <laughs> that not many well, people are willing to explore anymore. But <laughs> Well, I thought you maybe were just floating it out there because you were saying perhaps... Mm -hmm gender identity, your, how you identify internally, how you feel internally, is a reliable but fallible indicator of what, what, what gender you are, whether you're a man yeah. or a woman. And what, what that would mean is, if it's fallible, mm -hmm. somebody might identify as a woman. And be wrong. And be wrong. I mean, I would agree with that 100%, but I believe there's an underlying fact of the matter relating to it. Um, I think that a lot of the people that have moved on to the self-ID thing, I think that they don't believe there is an underlying fact of the matter anymore. Um, oh. I, they like maybe we can try to like logically analyze the statement. It's like, well, if you are, you are. But I, I, I believe that the the gender thing is morphed more into kind of like um, like an aesthetic thing or an expression thing. Um, and an expression to some extent can, I guess, just be what you want it to be. And there is no longer an underlying fact of the matter, which is why it's impossible. Because if you would ask a lot of these people, I think a good indication is like, could somebody be wrong if they self ID as a man or a woman? And I think the vast majority of people say, no, you can never be wrong. And it's like, well, if you can never ever be wrong about a particular thing, then it kind of feels like you don't believe there's a fact of the matter about the thing, which means it's something completely different at that point. That's what it feels like to me, I guess. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So then my worry is like, I'm, if somebody held that view, mm -hmm. um, and I agree people do hold that view, then for reasons I gave earlier, I'm I'm not sure that the phrase is a woman or is a man in their mouths is Means picking anything. out any property. I don't think it refers to any property. Yeah. Because there is no there is no property like that. And so then the worry is, um, yeah, what, what do we say about sentences then? Like, I'm a woman or I'm a man. And that was if kind of my I'm issue just, earlier when I said, like, it feels like there's no more content in the word man or woman. Yeah. Is it, yeah, you've kind of done that. Yeah, so then th that's the worry. Like, I don't, I'm not sure what's being said. Um, but again, like, I think some people are willing to uh, consider the possibility that self-ID might be a reliable um, but infallible guide to whether someone's a man or a woman. Um, did I say infallible? I meant fallible. Reliable fallible, but yeah. fallible. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I remember I presented this paper at a conference, uh, maybe one year ago, a year and a half ago. Um, and I guess, I don't know, I don't want to like name any names. Maybe the person didn't want this shared publicly, but, um, and I've heard at other places too online, like some trans individuals will say, um, as someone who's egg cracked, is that the phrase? Like somebody who's oh, egg no. cracked yeah. later in life? Is yeah. That, I think that's what they say. The, it's um, the idea that like if you are like a tomboy or a feminine man that truly um, you're really just trans and somebody needs to wake you up to that idea basically i think it's kind of a toxic uh, way to engage with gender stuff but yeah oh i didn't know that i thought it was just an expression for like when i had the realization or when um when it I could realized. be that too i i've seen it plotted different ways uh online it's kind of weird i it, it could be harmless uh, actually i should say i shouldn't assume the worst there i'm so sorry um but i gotta be i gotta be careful using yeah I see I, i've online. seen it used online where people say like that like we need to crack the egg you know where you've got like a tomboy or a feminine man and we need to make them oh, realize that they're I trans mean, we're cracking the egg or something basically yeah oh i see but it might not always wait, be that way sorry yeah go ahead so, setting aside that phrase, I think what was being said was, um, I think some trans individuals would describe their experience this way, like I, um, a trans woman might say, I used to think I was a man. I used to identify as a man, but I wasn't. I was a woman the whole time. Mm -hmm. And if that's true, then what they're saying is like, well, you can misidentify. You can identify as a man when you're actually not. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, which so, I would agree with that statement that you could have yeah, always been, so, yeah, because there is some underlying fact of the matter. Or there seems to be, I would hope, yeah. 
So I've heard some trans individuals say that, and um, yeah, so I think that might be like the way the direction is heading. Like maybe, maybe there will be a concession or a modest kind of retreat away from the thought that self-identification is absolutely infallible, can never be wrong, to just something a little more modest, like should be deferred to. It's sort of um, mm -hmm. authoritative in the way that like when you ask me how I'm feeling, like I have a kind of privileged access to that that you don't have. So mm -hmm. you should defer to my judgment, even recognizing that I could be wrong or mistaken. Um, so maybe they'll just defer to, they'll retreat to something like that, something a little more plausible and modest. Um, but yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see how, how things develop in this cultural conversation we're having. Gotcha. Because it does look like maybe self ID is cracking. Well, I'm using cracking again. Yeah, <laughs> but I, yeah, I understand that in that sense. Um, it's less popular than it once was. People are less dogmatically committed to it. I think I, I heard that ContraPoints, is that right? What's called ContraPoints? Mm -hmm. Recommended, like, instead of using the slogan um, trans, women, trans are women, women are women, switch to like trans liberation now. Mm -hmm. um, so that might be a kind of like retrenching or concession. And I'm seeing something similar in the philosophical literature, like a move away from trying to actually come up with revisionary definitions that will include everybody who should be included and exclude everybody who should be excluded. They, they seem to be moving away from that towards just a project of like, well, let's just try to make life as good as we can for everybody and free people from oppression and fight sexism and racism and misogyny. And we'll set these definitional questions aside. I, my sense is that that's happening in the philosophical literature too. So I'm not much of a prognosticator, but that seems to be the direction things are heading. Gotcha. Okay. Well, that'd be cool. Be good if that was the direction, I guess. But um, well, it'll take some adjusting and some. I don't know. There, there's there's some philosophers in print on the record saying like, if you deny anybody's self-identification, you are transphobic or horrible. Yeah, <laughs> you're a terrible person. Um, and so I guess we'll have to <clears throat> pretend that, that didn't happen or something. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, it feels like um, it's hard to tell outside of the academic world because you hear things and you see things, and it's obviously easy to select certain writings or select certain authors or you just peer into certain areas and, and get an impression, but. <laughs> Um, sometimes the impression given, especially outside of like the more rigorous, uh, like math or finance or econ fields is that, um, it's kind of running away in a certain direction and it can be hard to give pushback, um, either because of actual consequences or sometimes just fear of career consequences to providing certain positions, which if true, I mean, in a field like philosophy, that would be pretty sad when you guys used to kill yourselves all the time over your philosophical disagreements to go from that to um, being scared to publish a paper questioning a, a definition is kind of <laughs> a little bit yeah so it sounds like you're saying there's um, <clears throat> there's been a kind of chilling effect in the yeah. universities or it feels that people way are, yeah people are self-censoring and self-silencing oh yeah I can can confirm 100% mm -hmm. that's exactly what's happening <laughs> yeah and it's sad yeah because um, especially in philosophy I think philosophy is one of the last bastions when the last holdouts because it tends to attract people who are contrarians and free thinkers like that's why they get into philosophy and so um there's a disproportionate number of those sorts of people in philosophy and so um i think that that's why like when you look at anthropology and sociology and gender studies and those sorts of fields um there is a dominance of a certain kind of ideology mm -hmm. and there's no there's no dissent or very little dissent but in philosophy i mean yes progressive philosophers were kind of lament this that um philosophy is so as they'd say conservative or um regressive but i think it's just a sign that philosophy attracts a lot of contrarians and free thinkers and i, my, I myself in the same way i think that's why i got into philosophy um i find like if i'm in a room and everybody's agreeing on something, it doesn't even matter what it is, even if it's something I believe. <laughs> like, I start getting nervous and uncomfortable and I start raising objections. You know, like we can't all, we can't all agree on this. There's gotta be some problem, we gotta find a problem. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a lot of philosophers like that. And in a healthy university environment, that would be happening more than it currently is. Yeah. Yeah, because it seems like from from the outside world, it feels like there's a lot of headhunting that goes on sometimes, depending on who says what about what, which is sad, so. 
Yeah, and I think a big part of the problem is、um, like colleges and universities. You might have hoped that they would have stuck up for free speech and academic freedom, but my sense is、um, they feel like they have to comply with federal regulations, especially like Title IX sort of regulations. How is Title IX being interpreted in this administration? It was interpreted one way by.、Um, By certain, I don't know what it's called, like a memo or an executive order that just、mm-hmm. tells institutes of higher education how to interpret Title IX. It was one way under Obama. It was a very different way under Trump. We just got some new guidance from Biden.、Mm-hmm. And so, under every administration, like colleges have to react to the legal landscape. And I think what they're most afraid of is lawsuits and losing、Maybe. money. <laughs> can I? Give yeah, me like, so yeah, I did grab somebody for like five seconds. Okay, can you give me one second? Okay, hold on one second. Yep. Quick shout out to the chat. I imagine there's a chat happening right now, but I can't see it. But <laughs> I know it.、Um, pretty sure it's happening. Okay.、Um, Title IX interpretations. Biden gave new interpretations. All right, go for it. Yeah. So again, I was just saying, like,、um, that's why、um, I know you might have been surprised to learn that universities, which are supposed to be, you know, guardians of free speech and academic freedom, have so quickly and、um, catastrophically. Caved to social pressure, and they'll they'll fire tenured professors, and they'll、yeah. and people feel、um, people with tenure feel like they can't write on certain topics or speak about certain topics, and it's well, because universities are clamping down on certain things, and it, I think it's because fear of fear of lawsuit. I,、uh, as somebody that doesn't know anything compared to you,、uh, and, and and how it actually goes, I I feel like I disagree.、Um, I, I the impression that I get, obviously you know this way better than me. This is just something I've gotten from all the things I've read, from the people that have been fired, from the statements of administrations. It, it maybe at one point Title IX was a fear, but it feels like there is a culture, a very, very, very left shifted culture in, not even in all of the school, but namely and specifically with school administration.、Um, that's something that I feel like pops up more and more. Maybe it's not the case in like the the most like social liberal arts departments, or whatever, but there's like this kind of like rift between school administration and like professors, to where it actually feels like generally, I feel like professors. I'm being very general here. Feels like professors still generally want to have like kind of like the open dialogue, the open discourse. Some of them are ornery or stubborn or whatever,、um, but that school college administration is very much in a different direction, and that it's not as much like a Title IX or lawsuit for anymore, but it's very much like a culture thing that's very pervasive among a lot of school administration. That, that's the feeling that I get looking at from the outside. Yeah, yeah. well, I've certainly thought about、um, the change in、uh, political leanings and political affiliations of faculty over the decades, and there's definitely been a Large shift to the left. I haven't thought so much, and there's explanations of why that is, and there seems to be a kind of like self-selection bias. Like as soon, we've we've long ago reached a tipping point in the in the political leanings of faculty, and this will affect hiring. It will affect the sort of climate that students find themselves in, and they'll make judgments about whether they fit in in a certain field based on like who they see in the faculty and how they feel. Their views are treated. So anyway, we've long ago reached a tipping point, and now you've got people who are very left-leaning in charge of hiring and firing and setting the coursework.、Um, so that certainly happened at the faculty, and it looks like it's probably not coming back. <laughs> yeah, and the problem is at that、um, point, like you said, with hiring, that's going to start to bleed over then into the actual like professors, the staff, and everything, and then. Yeah. So I don't know if, <clears throat> what sort of pressures have been on administrators, and whether there's been a similar. Uh, movement towards the left end of the political spectrum among administrators, or why that would have been,、um, but maybe maybe that has happened as well. Well, I guess、um, the feeling would be from the outside is that,、um, like, I am not to attack anybody working as a school administrator, but <clears throat> I I would imagine that to, I would hope I hope I hope I hope I hope I would hope that if you're going far enough to become a professor. If you've reached that area in your studies, that ideally you have been forced to critically evaluate a large number of beliefs, including your own, at, at multiple stages in, the, in your educational attainment. I would I would hope that's the case for anybody that's completed a master's or defended a thesis for a PhD that you've you've had to undergo some level of critical thought.、Um, 
So I would hope that the, that process will, if not weed out certain individuals, at least kind of temper the thoughts, the very like ideologically hardcore thoughts of some. But if you're a school administrator, you don't really go through that same process. So if you enter school, I imagine there's a lot of people that enter school very ideologically driven and will reach the end of their studies and by the end, I would hope, I don't know if it's the case. I know it's the case for me. I don't have a PhD or anything, of course. But like, I would think that like, man, when I was 18, I was fucking crazy. There was a lot of extreme ideas, I believed. And I would hope that a lot of people at the end of their PhDs would hopefully have similar reflections. Like, I remember when I used to think that or that. I was way too hardcore with this, but I understand this better. Um, and that that's a natural part of the educational process. But in terms of becoming a school administrator, you don't necessarily have to do that. You might get your undergrad in whatever, and then you might go on to be like, this is my ideological charge. I'm going to drive in this direction, and I'm going to be the school administrator. I'm going to do that. And there's not like the, the same requirements for critical thought or self-reflection or introspection aren't necessarily there on that journey, I would, I would imagine. Yeah, that might be right. I mean, it used to be that um, administrators typically came from the faculty. You You sort of like worked your way up into associate dean positions and then dean and then maybe provost and then maybe eventually president but um it might be the case that over the last couple of decades there's a move into the professionalization of the administrators where a lot of them have no background as faculty members they just went straight into the bureaucracy straight into the administration without mm -hmm without working as a faculty member, without having any sort of specialty in some academic field. I think that, that probably is the case. And yeah, if you, were, if you were asking me, is that a positive development or a negative development? Of course, naturally, as a faculty member, I'm gonna say negative. It should be faculty all the time, we're the best. Um, but on the other hand, I don't know, just to play devil's advocate, because I can't stand when everyone agrees about something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe it's okay to have specialists and specialized bureaucrats um, who are trained for the sort of jobs that they take rather than having amateurs step up and try to do the work of professionals. So I, I don't really know. Um, all I know is, yeah, there's certainly been a large scale chilling effect and a lot of self-censorship, not just among faculty, but I've, I've seen a lot of surveys lately just asking students, like, do you feel comfortable expressing your views in classes in college? And it's, the numbers of people, numbers of students saying, no, I don't feel comfortable, has been going up for mm -hmm. many years now. Yeah. And I don't think that's healthy. No. <laughs> yeah, I think the um, the two, um, we don't have to do this too much because I, I, I'm kind of so, I actually hate circle jerks. I don't like to just, <laughs> um, it, it, it gets boring very quickly. I understand that. Um, I, I'm only, I'm picking your brain though because you're a PhD philosophy guy on campus. So I'm kind of curious. Um, do you, um, it, 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 it feels like my, my impression is that college is cool because it should be the last place where you can get mind fucked in the healthiest way possible, right? Like I, you don't want to be ultra challenged at, at the workplace about your concept of civil rights, probably not appropriate. Um, but in college, it's like the last place where people can like truly rock your world. And then you've got like a really good place to sit back and consider your thoughts and have guidance on it with professors and stuff. And um, <clears throat> I, yeah, it feels like the evolution of college campuses is like universal safe spaces um, it, it bothers me for the two big reasons are one is because it stifles um, conservative thought, I guess, or, or other thought, challenging thought, um, which in a roundabout way bothers me for the second reason is because I feel like it weakens the thought of people that I, I would want to agree with. Um, one of the big problems I have, I'm sure you've seen like the Matt Walsh stuff, um, listening to that professor talk to him about the gender stuff and not be able to provide what I would consider to be adequate answers. And it's like, man, this is your job. Like you are the academic, you're supposed to be like the final boss of gender shit. So that if some asshole like Matt Walsh comes up to you, you're ready to be like patient, you should be excited. Like you get to talk on TV about the shit you studied in school. It's like every like academic person's dream. Um, and to become so standoffish and to sound almost like a college freshman is like so disappointing. And I, and I don't know why, is it because the challenges have disappeared to your beliefs? Is it because you don't feel that you need to defend them anymore? And yeah, that, that general train of thought, that line of thinking is like really bothered me for, for those two big reasons, stifling of multiple types of thought and then the weakening of schools of thought that I would hope to agree yeah. with. Yeah. No, I think you're right. I think that is the, the dream of the university or the ideal of the university is a place where you go to be sharpened you know, as iron sharpens iron and you want to have your beliefs tested, you want to revise your beliefs, maybe you change your beliefs. Um, but that does require like quite a bit of discomfort and it's a very stressful sort of process. I know because it happened to me, you know, um, especially in grad school, um, especially because I hold views that aren't very 
popular among um, academics. And so I just found myself like constantly being challenged, constantly having to argue for my views. Um, and so it was very uncomfortable and difficult. But um, if you survive and you're not just crushed by the trauma, I think it does make you a, a better person. And in, in my case, I think it made me a better philosopher because I learned like if I ever, if I'm going to stand any chance in any conversation with a professional philosopher, I'm going to have to be as clear as possible, lay out my argument step by step, defend every premise. Um, and I had to do that like every day in grad school because I didn't have the sort of views that people would just let slide. You know, they wouldn't just agree and say, well, of course, that's obviously true. So I had to fight for like every every belief I had. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that was good for me. And I, I, I am grateful that it happened. And I agree that we would want that to happen in the university. Um, but unfortunately, no, due to a lack of ideological diversity, it's not it's not happening. And even if there is ideological diversity, there's this chilling effect, there's self censorship. And so people aren't sharing their views. And yeah, I mean, I find myself doing it in my own classroom, I, I realize like, this would be a great opportunity to bring up such and such, but I don't want the hassle, you know, I'd, I'd rather <laughs> not, you know. Yeah. And so unfortunately, I think like, I realize I'm depriving my students of like a learning experience. But I know that there might be like one or two students in there who are gonna send the dean an email or something like that. And then I'll have to go talk to the dean for a while. And it's just those little sort of nudges that lead to self-censorship and lead to silencing. Um, I guess I should just clarify that like the things I'm gonna bring up, in, the things that I'm thinking about bringing up in class aren't like horrible stuff. <laughs> like, it's just like anything that's like kind of heterodox or anything that would be kind of contrarian or just challenging a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have like despicable, horrible private views. That the I'm utilitarian infinite child rape machine analogy or some crazy, you're not, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, um, well, I mean, we do bring up cases kind of like that when we argue against utilitarianism. Um, and that's that's fair game, although I would try to tone it down. Sure, yeah, yeah. Infinite child rape case, but yeah, stuff like that. Um, so I think that is um, depriving students of valuable learning experiences and um, unfortunately like making scholarship worse mm -hmm. because you really you need enemies you know you should well maybe not enemies but you need adversaries objections. you need adversaries yeah, yeah. Friend, friendly rivals you know? rival yeah that's how pokemon worked yeah. ash wouldn't have been anything if it wasn't for uh, gary or whatever right you need the yeah i mean the reason that we go to conferences as philosophers isn't because it like makes us famous or loved well, the reason I go is to get objections. Like you go there to present your work and then you want devastating objections from the audience because you can make your paper better. And if you don't get the devastating objections, then you publish the paper. Well, the objections are then going to be in print, you know, mm -hmm. and then it's sure. permanent. <laughs> yeah. So you want to like test rough drafts and get it thrashed and shredded and demolished so that you can try to make it better. And if we create a climate where there are no objections and there is no shredding going on, then the scholarship's going to suffer. And that's that's not good for anybody. Yeah, I agree. I think we're probably largely around this. Um, yeah. The uh, Just to um, finish up I, on the gender sex thing. So I'm sorry, I, we didn't actually ever clarify this. I'm curious then. If one were to say that gender is like a type of performance, and that's what we mean colloquially when we talk about like woman or man, um, but we also understand that woman or man could be a synonym for male or female, depending on the context. Um, would you agree then that like the performance of something is probably a little bit different than like the underlying biological property itself? Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't yeah I mean, the, the sort of expectations and stereotypes we have of males and females is mm -hmm. largely, very largely due to socialization. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's all socialization. I think there's some biological influence on the kinds of dispositions and inclinations that For sure. males and females tend to have. I think anybody who's worked with animals can see that. Anybody who's worked with small children can see that. But for sure, um, feminists have been correct to point out that l there's a large part of it is socialization. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if the proposal was, well, maybe the word woman is just ambiguous. And you know, sometimes it expresses the concept that the dictionary describes. But other times it um, expresses some different concept, maybe the Judith Butler kind of concept or the Gail Rubin, Sally Haslinger kind of um, social role concept. 
Um, so I'm open to that. Yeah, words can be ambiguous, and you can definitely introduce ambiguity very easily. Mm -hmm, um, for sure. We do it with names all the time. Um, but I guess I would just repeat that what Sally Haslinger and Judith Butler learned the hard way is um, any clear statement of like what, what it means to be a woman um, is not going to respect everybody's self-identification. Yeah, because of course. You can have, yeah, you can have some <clears throat> trans women who don't owe you femininity, as they say. They don't adhere to expectations associated with females. Mm -hmm. And you can have... As I said, I think I think the term is trans femme non-binary individuals who identify with femininity, um, express themselves in a feminine way, and so would meet the Judith Butler definition of performativity, but um, don't identify as women, don't consider themselves women. Mm -hmm. um, and so there too, the performativity definition would fail to respect everybody's self-ID. So yeah, I'm not opposed to ambiguity in language. It happens all the time. Um, I'm not opposed to changing language. I guess all that I've been pointing out in my work is we've got a serious problem here with the, the idea that any acceptable definition of womanhood and manhood is going to respect everybody's self-identification. Yeah, that in the attempt to kind of like ameliorate some social problem, all of a sudden we're taking like epistemology hostage to try to like do crazy work to change how we define and understand everything. And it's probably not a good yeah. thing to do. Yeah. And I guess I'll just quickly add, like, I understand that the intentions are good and, mm -hmm. um, People are pointing to, you know, very real positive consequences that come from affirming people's self-conceptions. Um, so I recognize that. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I should also add that what gender critical feminists seem to be saying is there are also consequences of changing our language in this way. And they're losing the ability to legally um, define and defend female only spaces mm -hmm. um what they used to call women's only spaces but now they call female only spaces like prisons and sports and locker rooms and so on mm -hmm. um so i guess i'll just say um although i recognize the benefits of you know um affirming an, a sort of affirmative approach to this project uh, i just wanted to quickly add that it's not so simple and we should also be honest that there are some costs Sure. Associated with this change. Um, and that's Which we're what seeing now in the United States with like the swimming stuff, the Leah Thomas stuff and everything. We're starting to see the the downstream of stuff of yeah. being careless, I guess, with our definitions. Um, and then the blowback, unfortunately, from that can be catastrophic, too. So such that you're not even serving your moral ends anymore by what you were trying to do before. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you I think that's a good way to put it. Yes. Mm -hmm. OK, well, hey, is there any. Um, Anything else you want to go over or do you want to plug like a social media where can people find you or yeah. If you, if somebody wanted to read my papers, if you just Google my name, typically the first result is a little Google site with all my papers on it that are freely accessible and not behind paywalls. So if you wanted to check some of that stuff out, you could. Um, and I'm also on Twitter and if you just search my name, you'll find me on Twitter. Um, but yeah, that's all. I just, I guess I also wanted to say, um, thanks. Thanks for having me on. It was really nice talking with you. Um, yeah, it's been nice learning about this this part of the internet. Um, I've been happy to see what's going on here and uh, recognize that you're a major part of that. And so, good good work. Cool. What I'm saying. <clears throat> well, uh, I'm not proud of anything that exists here, and it was a mistake, and all of it is cancer's <laughs> horrible trash. But um, I hope you enjoy your time here before somebody tries to dox, swat, and kill you. So good luck. <laughs> Thanks for. Um, <laughs> Yeah, thanks for the conversation. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, hopefully we can talk again in the future. All right. Bye.